Chapter 1, Introduction Welcome to Precision Massage and Healing's first audiobook, What Massage Therapy Taught Me About World Peace. Precision Massage and Healing is a non-profit because there is simply too many people out there in pain and need but can't quite afford the help or the time and our hope is to be able to provide hope to the helpless whether or not our people have money because there's many pathologies and conditions out there that our western world believe is impossible to help like fibromyalgia lupus clinical depression and so on that we have had success in not just on our own but in concert with the client their doctors and own wellness routines etc that we'll be diving into later we are also going to have additional audiobooks to help as many of you out there as possible with your own lives, overcoming your chasms, your pain, your chronic pain, depression, anxiety, etc., and hopefully to a larger scale, world peace itself. For there is way too much pain out there, and it feels that these days that we're sort of heading to this crossroads where things could easily become more negative. Yet if we work better at positivity itself within ourselves and then outwards and with others, only then do we have a chance at world peace itself. Now real quick before we get into the story and further chapters, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the company and where it's come from. And basically it was born in the positive energies of California, forged in the fires of New York, and refined by some of the toughest clients available who themselves were facing career devastation without intervention. Uh, just to give you a quick idea of the depths and molding that this company has gone through to get to where it is today and to get as powerful as it is in helping others. The power of combined modalities, hot stones, essential oils, and so on is just awe-inspiring to me, but I don't want to get into that too much because this book is more about uh, world peace itself and I think it's kind of interesting if we take a step back and look at the universe and its design, whether or not it was created by God or the Big Bang or God using the Big Bang to create the universe and so on. Its design is interesting because space is always increasing between planets. At first, it just seems like chance, but to me, that's a little revealing about ourselves and the universe. Like, did the designer of this universe feel that we were so prone to anger and war, that they decided to keep having the planets grow apart at an accelerating pace that only the most sophisticated and enlightened races could possibly traverse its distance. Are there root questions in peace and anger that the maker was worried about since the beginning? I find this stuff very interesting. A little bit about me uh, I didn't realize it, but I was kind of born into a cult. Some of the most exhilarating times of my life, I truly believed that my religion was the only one that had answers for world peace. The only one that had a chance to save the world, basically. And I sacrificed everything I owned. I gave up everything I had to be essentially part of the clergy. And unfortunately, it turned out that it too fell prey to this thing in our universe, our world, that seems to corrupt even the purest of intentions, no matter the rockiness of its beginnings, into being overly interested in the wrong reasons or the wrong purposes, where a religion that was created to promote peace and welfare began to only care about its income over the wellness of its parishioners, that became tried, that wanted to unify people, that became a great source of disparity, disconnection, and so on. And it is quite sad, not just for the religion I was a part of, but for any group to sort of lose its way. Because I feel that us as human beings, we have amazing potential at truly making this world a heaven on earth. It just, it seems something keeps pulling us down to be more afraid of each other, to being quicker to act and slow to listen. And for my own religion, I hope that one day they are able to let go of their divisive measures, let go of their own fear-mongering and hatred and thinking they're the only ones with the answers to anything, which is when the point that a group becomes a cult is when they think they are the only ones that understand, the only ones with the answers, the only ones who can protect. Attacks or criticism of the founder is then felt as criticism or attacks against the very people. Like, there's nothing wrong with supporting or believing in whatever 
system or government or leader that you want to is just doing it to the level of cultism becomes dangerous. For it's up to each and all of us to hold our elected leaders accountable. We can't live in a way where as long as they tackle the things that we're afraid of, then anything they, else they do is not of our concern or swept under the rug. Like it's up to each and every one of us to hold our politicians accountable. And we all think that our voice doesn't matter, but I assure you it does. We can't let the only people calling people in power, like the oil companies and so, so on and so forth. But I digress. I don't want to get obviously too much into politics and more into what I feel is the root causes that is slowly poisoning all of our relationships, friendships, careers, studies, literally everything in this world, including things that we just assume are natural processes of the disease called age, all have one common denominator, which I find exciting that we'll be getting into in the next chapter. Um, and then also, we will be having additional audiobooks along the series, uh, you know, like one on relationships, one on recovering, recovering, overcoming one's chasm, and so on. And the hope is that these audiobooks can help to give hope to those who think things are helpless, who think things are impossible to improve for whatever reason. And I assure you and everyone that nothing in this world is impossible. You know, when I dived into my religion, I got to a point where I found, found myself standing at the top of a roof, ready to jump. And still at that point, I didn't think anything was wrong with my religion. I thought only it was only me, only I was negative, only I was failing it and not the other way around. At the same time, I was three months away from death of candida overgrowth, and I barely escaped. Barely. And recovering from that was tough. I was in the darkest, most depressed chasm I was ever in. When I first escaped, I, need, I needed about 14 hours of sleep a day and still felt dead tired. I was so depressed that any time I took a bath, my mom would barge in just to make sure I wasn't ending at all, which only then depressed me more. Surviving that chasm, overcoming it, was tough. And of all things, I decided to start writing a fantasy book. But the mistake I made is I wrote the book I thought others wanted and not the one that I wanted. As a result, it became watered down and it did become a bestseller for two hours. And if you were on Amazon in those two hours, you may have heard of me, otherwise not so much. But I know from experience that recovery from the impossible is actually more possible than we think. It's, it's interesting how negativity itself can feel magnetic, can start to become a vortex or a black hole by which any escape seems the most impossible thing that we've ever imagined to the degree that we, so many of us have just decided that's life and we have to deal with it. But throughout this book, you'll see that nothing, no amount of negativity or hatred or pain or depression is forever. And there is always something we can do to get a little better, a little stronger, a little healthier, a little more positive day by day or week by week or month by month. So thank you very much for listening into this audiobook. You will not be disappointed. And without further ado, here we go. Chapter 2. Fight or Flight In the times of the caveman, our bodies were designed with a system that helped us survive literally with our lives. When we felt our lives were in danger, our bodies would go into what's called fight or flight mode, where it would send blood and energy to our extremities so we could better fight the thing, or hunt it, or run like mad from it. Unfortunately, in today's society, neither option is usually the best, especially in a relationship, job, or career. In fight or flight, it will also, to preserve energy, much like in a sci-fi film where the ship would send all energy to shields, our bodies would shut down healing, digestion, memory, logic and reasoning, turn on painful self-preservation, all in the hopes of better fighting this tiger at hand. But when our healing shuts down, we begin to age. When our digestion shuts down, we just can't eat or get the nutrients that we need. We also get 100% in 
calorie retention, where weight loss programs become impossible. With memory shut down, study becomes impossible. Tests become one of the most terrifying moments of our lives, or having to speak or rehearse lines, or be able to remember our own mistakes and misdeeds in the face of someone we've hurt or angered. You know, our logic and reasoning at best become very, very narrowly focused to the one thing that we fear, that we think is the problem at hand, and completely lose the ability to see in bigger pictures, or God forbid, from the other side. You know, when painful self-preservation turns on, our brains dictate that we become worried and concerned about our own pain, our own needs, our own survival, and become unable to listen to others. It's like, it feels like you're dying on the floor with a samurai sword through your stomach and someone else next to you stubs their toe. You were, we're expected to then be like, oh, are you okay? But that's exactly what we need to be able to learn to do, but we'll get more into that later. It's just important now to understand each of these parts of fight or flight. With painful self-preservation, as I call it, I'm not sure if that's actually a term, but I call it painful self-preservation because at the same time our brains designed to help us survive become worried of things that could affect our survival, like our mistakes, our phobias, our insecurities, and it then gets the brilliant idea of reminding us about all of them, all of our failures, all of our, everything that we think is wrong with us, and we end up becoming a second degree black belt at kicking our own butts and have no patience left for actual criticism and feedback from others. And they sense that. And there's things that they want to tell us that could help us become better coworkers, better peers, better friends, better lovers. But they can sense that that criticism will only hurt them that much more. And in painful self-preservation, I feel a little more men than women can feel like if they get one more criticism, one more complaint, one more anything, they could literally die a painful death. Whereas women, I feel a little more often than men, when they go into painful self-preservation, they can feel worthless or fat or undeserving or things along those lines. All of us basically are in pain in that point. We can't heal, we can't digest your memories. We're in pain, but we can't communicate. We only gain the ability to scream and shout for the things that we are worried about, as dictated by fight or flight mode. And back then, back in the day when you were being stalked or preyed by the tiger, they could be sneaky and hide around for up to three days to try and get to you, roughly. And thus today, a single moment of stress or worry or fear or injury can last for up to three days as well. And most of us have far more stress than one instance every three days. And thus most of us are perpetually in this mode called fight or flight, where I think you're starting to get an idea of how this can affect all of our relationships, careers, lives, governments, and world peace. Like world peace is not possible when we're each stuck in our own fears, our own worries, our own uh, needs, our own beliefs, being completely unable and less and less able over time to listen to the other side, to understand the other side. Like extremism is not the answer to our world, but becomes the only answer when people feel the middle ground is impossible. Like too much of anything becomes a bad thing. Harvecker says that we have a financial blueprint where when our bank account falls under it, we work hard to correct it. Reversely, when our bank account falls over it, we also work hard to correct it. In fight or flight, we have set an extremely low bar for our own wellness. When our, and when our wellness falls below that critical point, only then do we start seeking help. 
Only then do we consider seeing the doctor or massage therapist and so on. And when our wellness level passes that extremely low blueprint, then we go, oh, now we can have more alcohol or soda or ice cream or whatever it is to work hard to bring it back down there. Now, fight or flight also dictates that we turn to the very things that kill us. You know, unfortunately, caffeine, sugars, and processed food accelerate depression and energy loss over time. And they don't have to be cut out completely. This is not an audiobook about trying to eat like a monk or anything, but it's important to understand what things are doing. Like turning to caffeine, processed sugars, sodas, uh, dear God, diet drinks, for mood and energy is the same as turning to a loan shark for long-term financial stability. For what it gives, it takes twice away in the long term. So they don't have to be completely cut out, just understand to the degree that they are consumed. The other wellness activities that we'll get to later must be done to compensate. You know, in fight or flight mode, negativity becomes a powerful vortex that's magnetic, that keeps us in that mode, can become a black hole or an inescapable chasm. But the interesting and unfortunate fortunate thing about negativity is it doesn't just change our words and our moods, it will change results for the negative, even in disrelated fields. Whereas positivity on the opposite scale not only affects our moods and the words we say, but leads to more positive results even in disrelated fields as well. But in our world, when we receive pain or stress, we get more tension, more negative results, more accidents, more injuries, which then lead to further judgment, pain, stress, and so on. Like our universe, unfortunately, is set up where our downworld spirals can accelerate very quickly. Just like in this world right now, I feel we're at this point where things could easily get worse and very quickly. Unless we each learn the messages throughout this book. And this isn't just me. It's not like I discovered all these amazing things. This is the healing world. What massage therapy has to teach about world peace. There's too many people out there pointing fingers, saying how other people need to improve. For world peace begins with self-improvement and to in fight or flight, self-improvement is an insult and is used as a weapon against others. Like, you need to heal more. No, you need to heal more. It's like we all kind of need to heal more. Hello? You know? Or like, you need God. No, you need God. Or you need to see the priest. No, you need to see the priest. You know, like, healing is not a weapon. It's something we should each be doing on our own anyway. But we'll get to that. And what's funny about fight or flight is we think the one time for sure it helps us is in combat, hand to hand. But as a second degree black belt, I can assure you that is not the case. As any professional fighter will tell you, whoever remains more calm in the fight wins. Now that only applies to the professional world of fighting because for everyone else, the number one reason we get hit is because we do nothing, lock up in paralysis and take the hit. We're so worried that, for one, why is this person trying to knock my face off? But then we were so worried of correctly gauging the punch, of making the right move, the right block, and so on, that we just end up getting hit anyway. And then the extra energy that fight or flight does give becomes apparently beneficial. But when you're trained, when someone is angry and coming at you, their move becomes extremely apparent from miles ahead. It's just, it's funny when you train in martial arts and fighting and you get to this point where the anger that used to paralyze you in fear, you then welcome more. And where you used to fear someone in rage coming at you, you then instead fear someone staying calm and dancing on their toes. In life, everything that we assume is part of age, as far as losing love for life itself, gaining tension, health issues, harder to connect with others, harder to create new friendships. That's not a part of life, that's fight or flight. I believe that age is a disease that fight or flight greatly speeds up. And I'm not saying we should all be immortal, but we should all be able to live maybe 200 years and healthy and happy years where our lives are not made more negative by the power 
of our fears manifesting, but by our demand of positivity manifesting. As we'll mention later, it's like this universe was literally designed to give us everything we've ever wished and everything we've ever dreamed. But since it's a machine, it can't tell the difference between our fears and our dreams. And thus it's up to us to more f fill our heads more with what we want and less with what we don't or fear or worry about. You know, like I have the saying of, you're not aging, you're stressed. Our bodies don't seem to have this time clock of when we're supposed to go through each phase of the aging process. And the only thing by which our bodies you seem to use to judge the passing of time is the amount of stress that we face. You know, so you have people who are 40 but look 80 and vice versa. And it's affected by our own math of positivity itself. The darker of a place we're in, the more we fractionate or get rid of positivity altogether. And the more we climb out of that chasm of negativity, the more we can start to value positivity for what it is and start to discount or even negate negativity altogether and becoming more focused on solutions and less on the pain from our past. But we'll get into that more. But it's funny in life, you know, we tend to quickly only value the negative. You know, like I had a, you know, a client mentioned that a husband had said that she was fat and then later said, I'm sorry, you are beautiful, you know, but to her it's like, no, you've spoke, you've spoken the truth. I know how you really feel now. But why don't we say the opposite is possible? Because no one ever says something mean like you're fat or ugly. And then later when they're feeling better, they're like, no, seriously, you're fat. And I'd be like, put, hide that stuff. You know, it's like no one, when someone says something negative to us, why can't we just say maybe they were just off? Maybe they didn't mean it. And when that same person gives us a compliment, why don't we tell ourselves maybe they know a little bit about what they're talking about? Maybe I'm not Captain Amazing, but maybe there are things of me of value. You know, like if a bank account acted or if a bank acted the same way and only counted the times that people took money from it and not when they returned it, it would think it was bankrupt and want to close. Thus, we have to learn to count our small accomplishments and learn to change our inner and outer language as we'll get to. And unfortunately in our world, depression isn't just for those who are struggling. The rich and wealthy feel it as well. Like Robin Williams is one of the most genius comedians of all time, I would say, committed suicide. Will Smith has amazing videos that he did with his wife on their depression, which I found incredible because these are some of the sexiest, happiest, ni nicest people who are rich, wealthy, have a mansion, an amazing family, all the gadgets, and still suffering from depression. It's like positivity is isolated from our world at hand. And it doesn't matter if you finally get all those things that you thought you needed to be able to feel better. It, it appears that positivity itself is an isolated muscle that we have to go through the pains of strengthening. You know, and anything that you work on at first is going to suck. It's going to take a lot of effort for little gains. But anything you stick to then starts to show the magic, magic over time. Depression isn't just for those of us who are struggling financially or who don't have the relationship we want or the position we want and so on. It pushes us into this state you know, where we just become unable to appreciate the positive things in life. I mean, if a tiger is trying to kill you, who cares if there's a flower? Positivity becomes discounted. Who cares if we look good that day? Who cares if the previous day we made a really cool sandcastle? All positivity becomes worthless. Writers actually have to struggle with this problem. Because if, as a writer, if you make something too positive, audiences at large who are in fight or flight and have their own areas of depression will immediately discount it. Like, no, no, this isn't life. You don't know what you're talking about. Life is painful. Life is tough. And life, things don't work out. But instead of, as a writer, you put pain, like someone dies, the audience will go, oh yeah, that sounds like life. But the problem becomes, if you make a story that's too painful, you'll make money, but you'll leave people worse off than before they came to you. You'll be accelerating the decline of our world. You'll be add, cr adding to divisions and so on and so forth, mistrusts and all that, you know, but if, you know, you make something too positive, you're, you're not going to make money. So finding that balance as a writer is tough because of how many of us are in pain. You know, you like, it seems like you can almost judge a society by what types of stories it values, you know? And a lot of the stories out there are amazing, don't get me wrong, but it's just interesting how quickly 
we discount positive stuff. You know, if something even sounds positive, if something even sounds like maybe it has can add hope or something, we'll immediately discount and go, oh, no, that's like including this book. Like, I'm sure many of you right now are getting that I'm saying there's actually cures to this stuff that's effective. And just by saying that, this entire audiobook immediately to a lot of people is going to sound like a fairy tale. But I assure you, it's not. By the strength of the chasms I myself had to escape, and the strength of the chasms I've had countless others. And it is because I have $40,000 of training in massage therapy, which is a bit extravagant, but don't get me wrong, the training was amazing. But 80% of what I know of healing came from my clients, for they would teach you the true depths of pain, and thus you then have to better understand the recovery. You know, in fight or flight, all of us, to a degree, become negative people. We like to think that, and don't get me wrong, we are all awesome, but here's the difference. You know, once I had a really, really negative client who was in a really tough place, and they're like, I'm so negative. Why don't you just give up on me? Let me go. And I said, if you went to a museum and saw a Mona Lisa painting, would you want it? And they said, of course. And I was like, well, what if it was covered with dust? Yeah. And what if it was covered with layers and layers of mud? Well, yeah. I said, see, that's you. To which they replied, I'm the mud? I was like, no, you're the Mona Lisa. And I truly believe that each and every one of us are amazing, inspiring, fit, attractive, intelligent, wealthy heroes and heroines. And it's just our anger, our fear, our guilt that dims our light. The fight or flight we think is there to help us, but unfortunately in our modern world, it's only slowly killing us. And we have to remember that all of these things that we dislike about ourselves are not us, you know, and it's going to take real strength and courage to overcome them. But we'll be getting into that shortly. But we do at the least need to be able to look at others that upset us that trigger us and so on and know that those that is not them and maybe they're right maybe we're right usually it's going to be somewhere more in the middle in fight or flight we try to argue more about who's more right we're in rest and digest we try to argue how do we both become more right but trying to start seeing or thinking that maybe just maybe there is some truth and some beauty and the other side and the outside groups or forces other than the few ones that we stick to Chapter 3, Fight or Flight Across Our World Now it's important to understand how then fight or flight can start branching out into the world. And at this point, you don't really need me for this. So these are just more of my thoughts, but I'm sure many of you can start to see, connect the dots and see how different things are going to start affecting different things um, as it will poison every one of our relationships, all of our careers, our businesses, our governments and world. Until we overcome it, we risk the chance of losing the opportunity to. You know, where things could get so negative that we lose all possible hope. And we are far from that point. And if we can overcome fight or flight, our angers, our fears, our pain, only then can we have real discussions and progress towards peace. Imagining fight or flight in action, have you ever seen anyone angrily try to paint a wall and then pain just goes more and more all over the place? Or angrily seeing someone do something and just it just train wrecks from there or someone's at work and they're really stressed? And then just they just become more likely to make more mistakes, which then makes them even more stressed. And across the world, you can just see how the more stuck different groups get into their own beliefs of who's more wrong or who's more right and so on, it just quickly declines the peace of the planet. And it doesn't matter who's more right or who's more wrong. It only matters how can we fix things now. For example, we become triggered by the other's weakness and vice versa. Like in a relationship, we'll have something that we think is the truth that the other can't see. And this isn't even the complexities of global politics. This is within a single relationship of one man, one, one woman who believe the relationship is struggling for different reasons. Who believe that that singular relationship between two people is unrepairable. And it is, as long as both are in fight or flight mode. Where listening is impossible and conflict resolutions are impossible. Like I've always been myself a student 
student and I'd like to say a philosopher of peace, but I've always wondered how is it, how much of a chance do we really have at world peace if families and marriages have such a hard time? If singular individuals have such a hard time understanding and working with each other, how are we supposed to ever understand and work with each other on a larger scale? You know, especially when you start adding in X factors like different color skin and religions, you know, and that's why I feel these universal concepts of fight or flight dictating that we listen to rumors or anger and entirely discount positivity in ourselves and others, you know? Like, I like to think, in today's modern, hectic world, you know, where suicide hotlines are exploding, where wages are stagnant and cost of living continues to rise towards a distant but not too far point where the cost of living just exceeds all um, sanity, if you will, to a point where the cost of living is just no longer worth it. No matter the politics of either side, we should all be figuring out how can we engineer society to be more based on truth, transparency, and where life for the common person can be worth living. And yes, like, like obviously there should be a limit to welfare, and welfare should be designed to help to get people back into work, but there are also people who are paralyzed by clinical depression, easily discounted by anyone who has never experienced it for themselves or seen it in a loved one. But I assure you, it is far more powerful and nasty to deal with than fibromyalgia or The Rock or Bane from Batman. It is truly a beast that we should not be so easily discounting. Like, what would happen if Einstein was born today, in today's society? I believe he would be stuck in his mother's basement, depressed, and not believing in himself. You know, like, we, if you think about it, how, how we, we're just losing so many cures, inventions, and wealth to depression, anxiety, hatred, bigotry, corruption, and wars that only beget, beget more wars and hatred. You know, we're losing so much value. This world could so easily be such a blissful heaven on earth where transparency and truth and honesty and just and prosperity are the rules of the day. Like the entire reason I believe corruption and greed exists is a cultish belief that is in a later chapter that they and only they know the truth, thus they and only this they deserve to have power, and thus they and only they have rights. Which is crazy. You know, for all of us, the answer will lie in all of us, maybe a little, some in a little more than others, but never to the point of completely discounting others entirely. You know, like the whole point of a democracy is that our minds are united for the common good, not against each other, like it currently is, and as fight or flight would dictate. It's like they say, there's nothing to fear, but fear itself, for it will paralyze you in the face of your opponent or the th very things that you wished you could achieve. Like, there's nothing to hate but hatred itself, for its advice and actions will only lead to more situations that are then worth more hatred. For hatred only begets more hatred, war will only beget more war, negativity will only lead to more negativity, even in disrelated fields. You know, mechanically, the same thing happens, where pain begets more pain. It's just called the pain spasm pain cycle. We get pain in an area of our body, and our brain can't tell if it's from a muscular trigger point or if it's from a sword. So it, the brain will send a signal to slightly tense up that area to restrict potential blood loss. But because the other area is now more tense, it becomes more likely to create future trigger points and pain. And when that cycle goes out of control to the whole body feels like a trigger point, that's simply known as fibromyalgia, especially when the nerves become what's called over facilitated or oversensitive, much like when you get a sunburn, that light pressure is registered as high pressure or painful, you know, which is just the point when you know, oversensitivity of the nerves that we then call fibromyalgia. Like, it's interesting to watch it in action mechanically and not just energetically, you know. And it's fight or flight, or we can call stress mode or Eeyore mode, if you will, you know, enforcing us to become more and more gauge, engaged over our own triggers and less able to even have a conversation and turn ourselves to those who will shout the loud, loudest to lead us into the chasm. Like, we can't blame our government or our leaders for the way 
way things are going if we can't ourselves bring peace to our own minds and relationships. Yes, protest. Yes, be active. But at the same time, we can't be so preoccupied pointing the finger at everyone else. And we don't need to point the finger at anyone. We don't need to point the finger at ourselves. For some reason, with self-improvement, we, we think we first have to say that we're wrong or bad or crappy. When self-improvement is the beautiful path to becoming more attractive, more able, more successful, which we'll be getting in to more later, we will repeat the mistakes from a history, not because we don't know the history or ignorance of them, but we will often learn incorrect lessons. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but I say only if you learn the right lessons. Imagine there's two dancers in a dance class wearing boots, and they step on each other's toes, and it becomes this endless argument of who stepped on whose toes worse. Yeah, but you twisted. Yeah, but you're heavier. But, you know, it's this apparent unsolvable argument. When in Rest and Digest, they would say, why are we wearing boots in a dance class? Yet in Fight or Flight, they would say, walking away from that, we would say, you know what we need? Bigger boots. You know, like it's just comical, almost. The lessons we take away from things when we're already in pain or stressed or angry. For those lessons will always just lead to more of the same. For energy begets energy of the same kind, even in disrelated fields. You know, so I hope, you know, from this chapter that you can, that you have just additional ideas. And I'm sure you can come up with countless ideas yourself, you know, but the how much Eeyore mode or stress mode is affecting us is just incredible. And until we learn to truly each prioritize our own self-improvement, for world peace begins with self-improvement, we don't have a chance of solving the riddles of world peace, corruption, greed, so on. You know, and greed, I would say, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Someone who's greedy wants more for themselves, no matter the cost to others, so they can remain strong. But true greed leads to, you know, just holding on to larger and larger amounts of money, which then will devalue their assets over time and lead to stagnation. Like the show Heroes, where they say, if you're not going to do something for the right reasons, at least do them for the selfish ones. You know, like oil companies don't need to believe in climate change, but they do need to transition anyway. And we as a society should honor and help them with that transition. Chapter 4. Fight or Flight Based Self-Improvement All of us, to a degree, want to get better, stronger. But when that comes from an area of stress or pain, we invariably make things worse. Like a, for an example, I used to work for this vitamin company and the person before me did twice the amount of work of everyone else, but they were annoying and they didn't really fit in so they were fired. And on my first day, they bore down on me and they were like, hey, you're not gonna be like this girl, are you? And I was like, no, of course not, that'd be crazy. While in my head I was going, this is the lamest thing, reason for firing something I've ever heard. Um, and yet as the days went on, I wasn't really accepted, I didn't really fit in. I tried to buy gifts, I tried to do jokes, I tried to hang out with them, but nothing really seemed to work until I got the most genius idea ever to win their love and acceptance. I decided I would do twice the work of anyone else and only then would they accept me for me, which only made them hate me more. And then they began rumors. And rumors are tough because they tend to manifest them. So if you say something enough, it becomes true. And the recipient then has to work that much harder on their own wellness and centeredness just to fight said rumors. And they began rumors that I was angry. And the only thing that upset me were those rumors to the point where eventually I would, re I would respond to them saying, hey, we're hearing you're angry with, no, I'm not, fired me. I was so afraid of being let go. I did the very thing they didn't want which ironically was the very thing I thought they needed. And there's a lot of workplaces where unfortunately production is not the main measurement of value. For value, politically, can only be seen from those who seem to respect and love us. Like if someone doesn't seem to respect and love us, to hell with whatever their accomplishments are. A lot of people that will bash and hate on movie stars well, yeah, they're a movie star, but I don't think they care about me. I'm not saying that's the reason people bash on movie stars, but it's what greatly adds to that phenomena. And it sucks for the movie stars because they suffer from depression too. I found it really interesting hearing Taylor Swift 
talking about the moment where Kanye West took the stage and said she, she didn't deserve the award, and the audience booed, and in the moment, she thought the audience was booing her. And even though she learned that wasn't the case, that moment scarred her forever after. Just because someone doesn't appear to love us doesn't mean we can't appreciate their accomplishments and gains. You don't know what people think about you until you ask them. But it seems like in our world, until people come up to us and say, hey, I fully love you, I fully respect you, that we will completely discount all of their accomplishments and gains as irrelevant. In our efforts to try and improve, we are so often clouded by self-improvement without realizing it. The word self-improvement itself feels like an attack because we think we have to say, I failed, I'm a failure, I suck, before we can begin this path and we end up just using it as a weapon against other people. You failed, you suck, so you need to improve. When it's the beautiful path of becoming more able, sexier, stronger, wiser, more positive, and so on. It's like the very thing that we need to be able to enjoy our lives more, to become more successful and positive, become, becomes as apprehensive as sunlight to a vampire. Where people start shouting to each other to the point of, you need God, no, you need God, you need healing, and back and forth. The arguments often become who's more right, much like the two dancers, when it's, no, why are we even wearing these boots? And the other one will walk away going, well, I need a bigger boot. It's important that we learn to become content with where we are while we always work on growing. Yet in life, most of us are never content with where we are and never work on them and always continue to beat ourselves up for not being better, stronger, sexier, more able, more well-liked, more popular, more friend, whatever the things are that we wish we had, that only then could we be happy. It's important that we learn and we'll be getting to this more later, but to learn to be content with ourselves wherever we are in all of our fields of life while always moving on them a little bit, working on them just a little bit, growing in our love, our kindness, our wisdom, our strength, etc. until we have world peace. World peace begins with self-improvement. How do we know that we've grown enough as individuals once we have world peace? And finger pointing won't lead to that only self-improvement that is done from a place of self-acceptance. But we'll get on, get into that. This is more about, you know, how fight or flight messes up um, our self-improvement, you know, and because the problem with negativity and our fears is they tend to manifest. And like when I was working for the vitamin company, you know, like it's as if our universe is designed to give us everything that we want, but since it's a machine, it can't tell the difference between our fears and our dreams. And thus it's up to us to fill our heads more with what we want and the positivity and less with what we don't. In our world, unfortunately, we learn best by destruction and is part of the reason why precision massage, I feel, is as strong as it is because of the pain that it helped others to overcome. Why can't we learn more from positivity? Why can't we look at more positive people and say, yes, what are they doing? Instead, too often we look at them as, and we say, huh, fakes. You know, like it's, we have our priorities all out of whack. And sure, like Facebook is the place where we only put our positive side and never share our negative side. For this world does judge negativity. Like if someone gets hit by a bus and they come limping away, thank God they're alive. But then the other people around go, oh yeah, we saw you got hit by that bus. And you, you seem to continue to say how you've been hit by a bus. Um, you know about that job application? Uh, we will consider you, um, yeah, good luck. You know, it's like we distance ourselves from others who become pain. So depression is not just in people's head. The way our world is designed exacerbates it. You know, often, and that's why we're nonprofit, because often the people who need help the most have no one left to turn to. Especially like, you know, single mothers, interns, residents, um, the medical field, you know, people who are, want to make a difference but have ran out of steam and just need, you know, some extra help and advice to get a leg up. Like everyone out there struggling, for example, with, with test anxiety, you know, learning to get into rest and digest mode, which we'll get to shortly, is going to help you immensely. Doing treadmill study and things like that, like there's little bits of information that really go a long way to helping us. And thinking again towards self ER mode or stress mode based self improvement at work, it's like we'll also, or in relationships, like I'll show them and then in our efforts, we're like, darn, 
they like me even less now. I had a client who was overweight, which is part of fight or flight. Honestly, 100% calorie retention and depression and other things. And there's nothing wrong with being overweight. Our society is way too hung up on impossible beauty. I saw a study where people searching for models started to the google algorithms started to give them dolls like is this perfect enough for you and it wasn't there were still things they wish were different with the dolls we really have to get away for our insane demands of beauty of others without while we also don't look at the inner beauty within not with negativity or judgment but with work you know in fight or flight everything is about my survival and needs me like uh, in peter pan when peter pan shows up there's a scene where uh, smee's like smee smee what about me and that's fight or flight by the demand of our brains not because we don't become selfish when we get attacked or when we're in pain it's just that our brains are demanding we worry about ourselves our own careers our own legacy our own finances everything and we become unable to listen to others and that's part of why when someone gets hit or depressed others don't want to hang around them as much because I've heard their story and I have my own pain and yeah it's unfortunate like we lose a lot of friendships relationships career opportunities for something so simple instead of thinking how can we become better able for others how was your day what can I do for you and less of I feel like I'm dying I feel like I'm not surviving I need you to listen to me and there's nothing wrong with listening to either side but you get how in fight or flight it becomes entirely self-focused at the cost of others around them and there's nothing wrong with that for anyone out there who is in pain and depressed um, like I know I've had my fair share of it and having to learn to overcome it I had a client who's really negative and they're saying I'm so negative why don't you leave me and told the Mona Lisa story but I also told them you know it's okay and they'd be like, how can you say it's okay? Especially things that are just, just logically not okay. And I said, well, if you had a dishwasher who broke a dish, and they said that's the way they are and that's the way it'll ever be. And then you had another dishwasher who broke 10 dishes, but they said, I recognize the problem, I'm owning this, and I'm working on it. I'm going to tell that one it's okay. So the point at which things become okay is only if you recognize that that is not you and that's just the mud. On your painting as a Mona Lisa and that you are working no matter how slowly to overcoming that right and that's the really tough thing too about people who are facing pain and depression is often others sort of distance themselves which makes it even worse and for all of you out there I am there for you that's also why I made this audiobook free to be able to reach you easier to be able to get these words of love and experience to you and on our website we're going to have a weekly online meetup for overcoming depression motivation healing and whatnot that I invite everyone to especially those who are lonely or just need that extra those extra few words of encouragement that's just so hard to find these days I had a client who came the other day and I mean I get you get how much I learned from my clients because they show me different ways of looking at the same thing so this client I'm talking to him about fight or flight and self-improvement and he's like yeah you know I'm really into all your stories I really like what you have to say and if me and my wife are together at the end of it then so be it I was like hold up if you're not becoming more loving more patient more tolerant over time then you're not growing you're shrinking he didn't really love me saying that but he got the point too often in our world we replace self-improvement with self-worry we'll read a book for a little bit and say huh I improved the other one still sucks huh because I need to leave them and yes there are situations that we should leave like abusive situations and so on but we shouldn't be so quick to discount others that are in pain if it's unbearable and intolerable sure but even then I would say at least try at least approach them and be like hey we're sorry you're in pain and we're there for you but um, the energy that you're bringing is kind of bringing us down a little bit and we're sorry to say that and we love you and we know this pain is not you but each of us we need to work at being better co-workers for you and vice versa instead we just uh, uh, you know I don't have the energy uh, good luck which is why this world is in so much pain because of how quickly we turn our backs and how rarely we listen we'll even get to the point in our relationships in our lives where we'll defend our anger habits etc over our own relationships that we're in or that we could have been in we tend to believe that we're certain ways or there's things about us 
that we believe identify us that have nothing to do with us as spirits and as individuals. Back when I was an actor, I used to so fiercely disbelieve in myself that when an agent would say, you're pretty good, we'd like to take you on, I would, in my brain, I'd go, aha, that's how I know you guys are frauds. I'll belong to no agency that'll have me for an actor. Much like the old thing, I wanted desperately to make it as an actor, but in my fears and my insecurities of fight or flight, I just got in my own way. Which is how it works. It's not just me, it's not just someone else, this is how all of us are designed when we fall into fight or flight deeper and deeper. And a lot of people out there will say, oh, I'm not, I'm not stressed, I'm not in fight or flight mode, everyone else just sucks. That's what someone who <laughs> it's more important to try to understand how these things work, how these things have been invisibly destroying our lives without us re realizing it. I'd make it to the rare audition and I'd be so afraid of not being accepted or loved for who I was that I would sit there and just say the lines, wasting everyone's time. And I feel very bad about that. In my fears of being judged, I became paralyzed, but in my paralysis, the cast directors, casting directors then thought I was gay. You know, there's nothing wrong about it, you know, nothing against being gay or not, it just wasn't me. And in my fear of judgment, I got more judge. I had a client who was the only Indian in her workplace, or the only Chinese in her workplace, and they were afraid of racism, they were afraid of rumors, they were afraid of what others would think of them. And in that fear, they would then look around their office, not with optimism, but with fear, with sideways glances, with worries. And though the faces they made then become became judged. A client that I know was so worried, I would call fear and worry part of fight or flight self-improvement. For fight or flight is saying, hey, I think something's wrong. I, th I think something's wrong. I think, you, I think you should really, really think about this. But then in us thinking about it tends to manifest it for how our universe seems to be designed to give us everything we want, etc. But since it's a machine that I can't tell the difference between our fears and our dreams, and that person in their fear of what people thought of them would walk into work with the ultimate resting bitch face. Not out of a dislike of the people there, but out of a fear of what those people would think. But then walking into that environment with that face made them then think that they didn't like them. And since they, you know, well, then we don't like you. It's almost comical how this stuff works. Or I've met a lot of people from different races who were so afraid and so hurt by racism from their past that they didn't greet me with indifference, but with anger. They were so afraid of racism, they became racist themselves, which is why we have to stop letting our fears and our anger dictate our actions, for it never works out for the better. No argument between a husband and wife ever results in, you know, honey, you have a great point. It's just not how arguments work. It's just not how fight or flight self-improvement works. And when self-improvement or worry is done in the name of fight or flight, it inevitably works out for the worst. I love how in the story Batman, there's this chasm, which the next short chapter talks about a little bit deeper, basically a place from which only myths and legends have ever escaped. And Bane, was motivated to overcome it from a place of anger and rage and what I would call fight or flight based self improvement and came out evil. Thinking he was fighting for the common person, thinking he was on the right track. Whereas Bruce Wayne came more from an area of what I would call rest and digest self improvement. You know, and came out a superhero, motivated more by his passions and what he cares about. And that's so too, that we must each learn to stop trying to improve or quote unquote fix things from an area of anger and more from a place of inner peace. Chapter five, The Chasm. Like I mentioned from the story of Batman, there's a chasm by which only missing legends could ever escape. But the chasm, metaphorically, is everyone out there who's in this situation or state that feels impossible to escape, like clinical depression, fibromyalgia, lupus, and so on. But all of them are exacerbated and made worse by fight or flight. For alone, it will shut down all healing, body and mind. 
or things over time, small things that we used to maybe even find endearing become infuriating and vice versa. The chasm is this area that we often can feel defines us, that we often can feel will just always be this way, things will always be this way, which are, in essence, negative affirmations. There's so much negativity in this world, we don't need to add to it by saying things like, I suck, I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving, no one loves me, no one will ever love me, no one respects me, I'm stupid, you know, and so on. Not only does it not help, it actually will manifest not like a, pow a wizard with powers, but magnetically, and help slightly that thing come about. What I love about the movie Batman, um, and I talk about it a lot, I mean, it's, it's a good movie, you know, I wouldn't say it was the best movie of all time, but what I love about the chasm in particular is just like in life and just like in the movie, there is always something we can do to improve things. There is always something we can do to make things a little better, a little healthier, a little getting into a little more motion ourselves, trying to organize our living space to be a little more enlightening or positive. When I was young, I used to wrestle with the old, older kids, and I'd get really depressed because they would always kick my butt. One day, one of them told me, hey, don't worry, kid. In wrestling, there's always a move you can do. There's no such thing as being stuck. I'm like, oh, okay. Didn't believe him. But sure enough, two weeks later, I was in a tough chokehold, and I was about to fall asleep. And out of nowhere, I rolled backwards and got out of it. I find just in life, no matter how stuck, or how formidable, or how painful, or how impossible a situation may feel, there is always going to be something that we can do to improve it. This is probably going to be one of the shortest chapters, but I just want to give you this promise that you'll see how it plays out in future chapters, that there is always hope, and not from a place of just fairy tale land, but in actual mechanical facts, for nothing in this life is immovable. And I hope that you take these future chapters to heart, for I promise you that with them, Truly anything becomes possible. Chapter 6. Rest and Digest Rest and Digest mode is the other mode of the body, of which there's only two, and there's not really shades of gray in between. You can say there's different degrees of inflammation and so on, but either you're in rest and digest, or you're not. Going about errands, going about your day, is not rest and digest mode. Believe it or not, not even sleeping counts as rest and digest mode, it's just sleep. And if your body is in fight or flight, it's gonna think there's a tiger literally trying to kill you, and it'll be like, stupid human, why are you trying to sleep when a tiger's trying to kill you? But rest and digest mode is truly a place of beauty. It's like the enchanted land, it's heaven itself, it's, it's that lake in the middle of the desert, it's, you know, it's the beauty that we never realized truly existed or forgot. It's a true oasis for not only does painful self-preservation turn off, where we become able to admire the flower, accept the small things in life, but it's also where all healing can begin of body and mind, where digestion can turn on where our body will only keep the calories it needs for survival. It's certain that we will indeed have a next meal. It's where energy production occurs. The only way to truly increase net energy is motion, ironically. But at least in rest and digest mode, it can create generally enough energy to try to help us with the healing process and so on. Um, and yes, in um, the book, audiobook, Overcome Your Chasm, will go deeply into all the things that you can do for healing and essential oils and all that stuff. But for now, it's just important to understand the basics of rest and digest. Memory turns on, so it becomes not only easy, uh, possible, but easy to study and take tests. Logic and reasoning open wide up, and you're able to think and understand things outside of our bubble. All of us have a bubble. And fight or flight will tell us 
oh, I'm not in a bubble. I understand everything except for them. You know, fight or flight leads us into these sentences that themselves make no sense. I understand everything except for them. That sentence makes no sense. It contradicts itself. But that's how we think when we're angry and stressed. Pain, and rest and digest, pain is able to heal. Injuries are able to heal. We're able to change the math of positivity. So instead of fractionating positivity and multiplying negativity, we can do the reverse. We can truly learn to accept ourselves. We can truly learn to... That's the only time self-improvement is possible. I mean, I've been wanting to learn Japanese and Spanish and Chinese forever, but I've generally been perpetually stressed myself until I've learned these lessons myself that massage therapy had to teach, which then led to me being able to pass that MBLEX, which led to me being able to help heal others, and so on. It's funny, no one in Rest and Digest will ever say, you're ugly, per se. There's times when people will be like, you're ugly, but later they'll always be like, I'm sorry, I wasn't quite myself, you're beautiful. No one ever says later, that when they feel better, no, no, actually, you are ugly, you know, as we mentioned earlier. And no one in this mode would be like, I hate myself, I'm a failure, or all these things. Because even failure itself only exists in the moment that we give up. And in Rest and Digest, it becomes easier to say, I may not have succeeded this time, but I'm going to keep trying, I'm going to keep growing, I'm going to keep improving. Self-improvement no longer feels like a weapon, but feels like a path of beauty itself that we look forward to. In fight or flight, we force ourselves to the gym and have a long recovery. In rest and digest, we can enjoy ourselves, our time in the gym, or in a class, or hiking, or whatever it is. Unfortunately, again, sleep itself is not rest and digest, it's just sleep. That's why it's important to learn to get into rest and digest before sleep, either with a hot Epsom salt bath, or just five minutes of meditation, getting off the phones 20 minutes before bed, trying to read a book, any book before bed. And you might have to, our minds are moving so fast that the speed of our minds, the change from that to reading a book or meditation may be too extreme, that you may have to do some sparring or some playful martial arts with anyone around you first to kind of like start slowing things down. You know, and the problem of a mind that's racing is it will never stop and say things like, oh, hey, by the way, you're awesome. It'll never be like, oh, and the other thing today, good job. No, it'll always be worrying about other things and plans and what am I forgetting and just loops and loops of worries and fears. I kind of wish that before all political arguments, you know, that all diplomats or politicians would first have to get a precision hot stone massage, like calm down, let's step outside of our fears, you know, and be able to find common ground that both works for businesses and the people. That help can let the rich stay rich, while we can also not ask the poor to just die off. But more importantly, it's important to understand how beautiful rest and digest really is. I believe that it's enlightenment itself that so many religions have been seeking. You know, because in Rest and Digest, that's when we truly become one with our environment, ourselves, and others. And where connection of any kind, even to ourselves, becomes impossible otherwise. And our hope is that more and more people across the world, more governments, more companies, more societies, can all get into Rest and Digest mode so that we can have a real chance of improving this world. Chapter 7, The Wellness Activities The Wellness Activities, what's really interesting to me is that no matter the pathology or the problem, whether it's a serious fibromyalgia, lupus, clinical depression, and so on, generally the same activities are recommended. It's fascinating to me. And they can change a little bit from each one to each one, and should always double check with your doctor. But they're basically, as a quick list, hot Epsom salt baths, drinking water, watching your diet, trying to stay more away from caffeine, processed foods, sugars, giving our body the fuel it needs, eating to be able to live better instead of living to be able to eat, going for more walks, uh, getting into more movement, at least like half a mile a day, or a yoga class, 
um, organizing our house, trying to make changes to make it more brighter, more beautiful, um, changes to our journey itself, where we can not be so worried and caught up about about our long-term goals, but just learning to truly enjoy the journey. Not being so worried about how much weight we're losing, but learning to enjoy our setup at the gym. Another, one of the toughest wellness activities is learning to change our language within and without. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but basically instead of saying, I suck, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be like, I'm awesome, but just a little bit more positive and instead say, I'm okay. Or saying, sometimes I suck, sometimes I'm okay. But the idea is that whenever you catch yourself saying something that's not positive, that you work on saying either the more positive version or just add the words, that's odd to it. I'll tell my 80-year-old clients to say, huh, I feel old today, that's odd. And we'll be getting into that more later, but just generally learning to change our language from negative affirmations to positive is incredibly important. If a husband always leaves the toilet seat up, instead of saying, you always leave the toilet seat up, you're just saying, huh, you left the toilet seat up, that's odd, that's unlike you. And then thus over time to ourselves and others, we can help each of us become more peaceful, more easier to work with, and so on. And that's why affirmations are such an important part of the wellness activity. They'll feel like a lie, as we'll get to later, but it's taking that time to say things that you wish were more positive or that you want to keep going are. It's training your brain and the universe to learning what reality should be. If we can't even just say what we wish reality was as if it was, it's going to be far harder walking that path. If we can't say we can get to the top of Mount Everest, you, your legs will never get you there. But if we can at least start to say world peace is possible, politicians are all just, our justice system protects the innocent, you know, until we can learn to start saying those things to ourselves, it's going to have, it's going to be hard to have a chance. And it's important, yes, that when things are corrupt or bad or whatever, that we fight for them. But we have to be willing to be positive. We have to be willing to believe. We have to be willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt. We have to be willing to try. And of course, a key wellness activity is massage. As we get stress, we'll get more trigger points and pain that then reduce patience and our love for life itself. It's tough how quickly things can contribute to further things bringing us down and pushing us deeper, deeper into fight or flight in the mud. When at Precision Massage and Healing, we don't charge anything for upgrades or hot stones or lavish use of essential oils and uh, etc. The only thing we do charge an upgrade fee for is CBD oil that is only really necessary for the for more extreme situations of pain. And we have pretty amazing wellness programs for like thirty dollars a month for a thirty minute massage is enough to for most people's maintenance and to help them stay in rest and digest, especially if they keep doing these wellness activities, you know, or sixty dollars for sixty minutes and there's other packages and whatnot. But at the very least all of us should at least be getting a thirty minute hot stone massage once a month. We can afford that time, we can afford that money. And conversely if when we don't take that time to care for ourselves, the amount of time and money and opportunity, opportunities that we lose, it's just staggering. And our world cannot afford to keep losing like that. Like winning is not kicking someone else's butt. Winning is when we're able to prioritize our own self-care, our own self-wellness, and our own self-improvement for the goal of then being able to be better there for others. And as long as we do that, world peace will no longer just be a pipe dream, but an actuality. One of the problems of wellness activities is that, is that inertia applies to them as much as any physical object. Whether or not it's motionless cement block, or a wellness activity, or a muscle. With inertia, it takes more energy to get something into motion than to maintain its speed, like your car. And that's why each gear becomes smaller and smaller, because you need less energy for it. Or if you were going to just work on, let's say, your arm muscles in the gym. The first day you go is going to suck. It's going to be more painful, your recovery time is going to be longer, and the gains are going to be very small. But if you stick to it, then over time, 
you'll see the gains over time will require less effort, more results, especially when working on the muscle of positivity itself, which appears to be completely disrelated to whatever is going on in the universe. We think there's countless things that we need before we can learn to be positive, but once we get them, we find that doesn't fill the hole. Like most people that win the lottery end up bankrupt. It's crazy. Positivity itself is truly in a different universe, and we have to learn to build it and channel it as if we were trying to work on a muscle in the gym. Also for anything that we're starting, there's this inverse curve of proportional gains, or another way of saying inertia, where when we start anything, it's not it's not going to be great. But as we keep at it, then it gets better and better. Like the, It's not the destination matters, it's the journey that we have to learn to love and walk, which we'll also be getting to more later. But this chapter, just want know these basic laws, and there's definitely others out there. There's definitely like teas, many different parts of diet, and there's many different things you can do to become more well, but generally they're, you know, hot Epsom salt baths. Taking that time each day to just disconnect from it all. And if someone, God forbid, something happens that's dangerous during that time or something, well, you wouldn't be able to make it to them anyway. So you have to learn to just let your fears go, to let your angers go, to let your anxieties go, and just completely disconnect from everything for at least a little bit a day and focus on nothing but your own mental peace and your own zen. You know, then drinking more water, diet, trying to stay more away from caffeine, processed foods, foods that you know kill you and your energy and your mood over time. Like, dear God, caffeine and sugar hits like a truck later on. But our brains just go, hmm, we must need more of it. And it walks, movement of any kind, getting into more and more motion and more movement to organize your house, journey changes, changing to a language, affirmations, meditation, and massage. Those are essentially the wellness activities. And each of us have to figure, or like um, aromatherapy at home as well, or um, essential oils. And each of us kind of have to figure out, like per I love mixing lavender and a little bit of peppermint oil. Just put on that on your shoulders in the morning or a peppermint oil. In our website, we have like different products that we recommend of other companies. Like peppermint oil is absolutely amazing for anyone that's recovering from an injury or fitness goals, etc. because it will fight inflammation while increasing energy of the area. I won't get that into that uh, too much here, but each of us have to figure out what our puzzle is upwards. Maybe it's asking someone that we love to spray us with a spray bottle with um, hints of lavender in it, and every time we say something negative, you know, like whatever it is, we have to figure out our own puzzles of wellness and just commit to staying in motion day by day, no matter how long it takes, no matter how slow our recovery may be. But as long as we stay in motion, then success no longer becomes a matter of if, but when. And I'm fully confident that each and every person out there, no, just no matter if their chasm has become a black hole or a vortex of which no light or escape is possible, I have full confidence that everyone out there can. Chapter 8. Rest and Digest Based Self-Improvement World peace, I truly believe that it begins with self-improvement, and if done from the right position, becomes powerful. You know, like a lot of us can be in situations or relationships that are just tough. Funny enough, if in the situations where helping someone else may be tough, the solution is still to keep improving yourself too, until you have the strength and the love and the compassion to be more effective in helping others. You know, like philosophers of old would say, I'm done with self-improvement once there's world peace. And as far as learning to enjoy the journey itself of improvement, I ran across this cute Buddhism story. There's three monks meditating for enlightenment. Uh, one has his eyes open, the next has his eyes closed, and the third is dancing with his shirt off and singing. The first asked Buddha, oh, Buddha, how much longer must I meditate for enlightenment? And Buddha looks very serious and says, mm, you need at least a thousand more years of meditation. And then the next monk then said to Buddha, what about me? I'm doing it better. And Buddha just replied, you do need at least a thousand more years of meditation. And then the third one paused his dancing and singing and turned to Buddha and said, what about me? To which Buddha replied warmly and smiling, saying, you need at least a thousand more years of dancing and singing. The moral is to not get so caught up 
into our, our goals or what we think we need to be happy, but to learn to make those changes within ourselves, our environments, our homes, our work, to make them more positive. And the better we do that, the better other things will come along. People who wish they were in a relationship, worrying about it is not going to help. Feeling hard on themselves about it is not going to help. But actually, you know, just working on themselves, their positivity, their health, and so on. Like a relationship, unfortunately in our world, a relationship is not the place for healing. I mean, and yes, we should always be there for each other. But it's more important that we each learn to heal ourselves, that we each learn to heal our depressions, and then bring that strength into a relationship. We can't wait for the thing that we want to help cure our depressions or our worries or anxieties. We have to learn how to walk that path on our own. So then in a relationship, we both become stronger. For example, one thing that relationships can do to better enjoy the journey is what I call adult tag, where one person does something for the other that requires physical activity. Buying a massage would not count unless it was unless it was with precision massage and healing. Totally kidding. Um, but giving a massage would count. And they say tag, explain the game, and then they have three weeks to do the same and return the favor. And you know, maybe each person writes a list of what the other can choose from. It's okay if there's only one thing. I mean, there should be two, so at least there's some wonder of which one is going to be, you know, so to speak. The other will need to approve them that those are things that they're you know willing to do, so to speak. They'll choose from them and not let you know. And yes, every relationship should have its protocols or its uh, routines of being there for each other. Like I truly believe that relationships should give each other at least a short massage each day. If even just it's a temple massage, you know, working from the brow outward, the eyebrows and so on, with no pressure is fine. Zero pressure strokes to the forehead going outward or moving around are very powerful anti-stress strokes. On our website, we'll have massage advice for couples and whatnot. But the game of tag, I think, instead of worrying only about bills and things in the future, then each side can have something to look forward to, not knowing. It just adds a little bit more excitement to all the day's mundane things, like your significant other or spouse uh, says they're going to the store, then you get to wonder for what. And in our world, in our paths of improvement, we tend to wrongly value strength. Like if the world saw The Rock and Gandhi standing next to each other, they'd say The Rock was a strong one. You know, don't get me wrong, he's an amazing guy, amazing actor, but Gandhi is the one with more strength in that situation because it takes true strength to reflect on ourselves, to work on our inner peace, to inspire countless others to walk the same path of peace and not hatred. And thus, like learning to be more peaceful, learning to be more zen, that's not weakness. That strength. Anyone can throw a fist, anyone can throw a rock, anyone can set a bomb, but to want to truly walk the path of self-improvement, to truly work to understand people from the other side of the aisle or from groups other than one's own takes real strength. And I applaud everyone out there. Overcoming one's own depression and pain, and dear God, depression and pain can often be a far more formidable force than any powerful supervillain in any Marvel movie. It's incredible how much force they can have. And motionless. In our lives, we can hit points where we hit paralysis. Along, We might kick ass in our jobs, but may feel more of a wreck in our relationships and vice versa. It's more awkward if someone is really good at relationships but can't hold a job. It's like, well, I would buy you flowers. Um, but motionless is not weakness. Imagine Superman. Powerful, can fly, can take a bullet to the eye and barely blink. Yet, with kryptonite, he can become beat up, tied down, beat up, and sent to paralysis. There's countless stories of all of our heroes at times where they were, times where they're darkest, to motionlessness. But a person's value is not based on the speed at which they move in, at a given course. For we are all invaluable. And when we do find the times where we are motionlessness, or where we're crying, or we're you know down on ourselves, or depressed, or in chronic pain, that doesn't mean that we're valueless. That means that the value of the negativity against us is as great or greater. You know, if like if a trillion dollar, say, spaceship in a sci-fi movie ran out of gas and was just drifting in space, it still has a value. It's still worth a trillion dollars, it's just out of gas and paralyzed temporarily. If you had a rocket shooting to the right with one ton of metric force, and you had another rocket shooting against it in the opposite direction 
with one ton of metric, metric force, they wouldn't move, in theory, along a single plane. The first rocket would be like, I'm weak. I'm worthless. Look at me. I'm not moving. Yeah, no, you have to consider what you're up against. And in life, our fears, our pain, our depression, our worries, our guilt, everything from the fight or flight world can become a true monster. You know, so people battling with clinical depression, like, they have to be seen for the heroes that they are, to, because to continue living with the beast inside their minds, holding them down, is impressive. And if those individuals can learn to overcome that pain, lessen that pain, and value their inner wealth, they have far more potential than, I'd say, the average person. It's like the old stories of a kickboxer wearing heavy weights around their ankles, and when they finally learn to become free of them, they can kick butt like no one else. You know, it, I hear stories of people saying things like, I used to have clinical depression, and then I realized that I am invaluable, and that did it for me. And there are many things out there that definitely can heal, but clinical depression must always be valued for the beast that it is, and people that are dealing with it must be applauded for simply staying alive. You know, like in our world, it's like an all or nothing reward system. Either we're Mr. and Mr. U Universe, or nothing matters. Either I look like the sexiest person on the planet, or nothing. If you did a single crunch, a single squat, a single step, you know, we have to learn to be able to value, honor, and take pleasure in our small steps in life, or we'll never take them. You know, because if a bank did the same thing, it would think it was bankrupt, never valuing the money that came back. And we can't, in our path of trying to improve from a place of peace, we can't let pain from our past dictate what we hide from or manifest today in how we talk with others. You know, it's like just because previous endships ended painfully doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Just because previous relationships ended painfully, painfully doesn't mean we should try. Like if in a previous relationship, if someone left because they didn't like how the other one smelled or they didn't like the antics for the organization or they were too busy or whatever it was, we shouldn't then say, well, that person didn't like me. No one will. You have to say that person was looking for a square and I'm a circle. So I'd say just don't keep looking for people who are looking for squares. On your dating sites and, and how you approach others, just be open from the get-go with who you are and what limitations are of time and considerations and whatnot. And if they're willing to still keep getting to know you, well then at least you know you're not wasting your time. And we sh at the same time, we can't be, when meeting others, be so quick to think we're just wasting our time. We should have some patience while at the same time being more open from the get-go. Like, I don't believe in, in the dating world and just generally getting to know someone and then getting them to know, and then six months down the line, you realize that they have a wildly different and unreconcilable belief system than yours. You know, and it's fortunate that our beliefs kind of define us, you know, and we should work on that. But at the same time, we shouldn't be looking for squares that are interested in squares where we ourselves are a circle. As we walk the path of wellness in life, I feel we can each kind of be more like the samurai of old, where they would spend their entire lives training by the sword in martial arts, knowing that one day their very lives would be on the line, dependent entirely upon their training. And if they failed to make it to one more class, if in that class they didn't do that last sword swing, that last form could potentially make the difference between life or death. Yet at the same time, their mentors and sentes would be annoying and insist that they practiced more poetry, more singing, more wellness. Certain their senseis were trying to kill them off. Yet, when they found themselves in the open playing, not knowing if the other one was more trained in martial arts or had a less annoying sensei, the one who was trained more in wellness was able to face them not with fear or anger or rage, but with calmness and pride, zen and swift action, and should that be their last fight, then so be it, but they would go down swinging with the pride and zen intact. Hence the saying. And so too I feel we can each learn to channel the samurai within, to face our fears, you know, our angers, ourselves, our inner demons, not with fear and anger and judgment, but with pride, with love, with understanding. Like Renee Brown is a beautiful motivational speaker. I believe she calls herself a storyteller researcher. 
um, with beautiful talks and vulnerability. And, you know, I think, like, I really think it's important to learn to walk our paths of self-improvement from a place of humbleness, of vulnerability, like the samurai. We're not taking anything for granted. We're not trying to force anything. We're just honestly trying to take a look. We're not trying to force our opinions onto other people. We're just honestly trying to walk this path as we also work on changing our language. Like I love Tai Chi because the theory is not to stop the punch and all of its energy, but to use just enough of your own energy to prevent their fists from hitting your face. Like everyone in their pinky literally has enough strength to move a punch. It's just about the timing and so on, and then having a strong counterattack. You know, like most, the reason why many martial arts may appear to be ineffective or weak is that most people who train in martial and other martial arts do it for fun at the rate of an hour a week or so whereas a professional boxer will train for four hours a day and at that point it doesn't matter what martial art you use but the heart of the training behind it like the story of the one-armed judo man who was trained only in one move in judo much to his anger but ended up winning tournaments because of his mastery of that one move much like in martial arts. Um, and as we learn to change our language from negative af affirmations like I'm angry, I'm negative, lazy, fat, etc., um, changing it to I'm angry sometimes or adding that's odd to it, like I'm really angry right now, that's odd. Or an 80 year old, I feel old today, that's odd, you know? Or to our spouse, instead of saying you always leave the toilet seat up, we say, huh, you left the toilet seat up, that's odd. You know, we're trying to say to ourselves and others that this is unlike you, for you are awesome. Like I caught myself the other day, I was doing eight hours of work back to back. It was a crazy day. I just, I was like, man, tomorrow's going to suck. No, no, I'm going to heal a lot of people and it's going to be awesome. And it's something that you're going to have to slightly listen for in your day-to-day -day activities with yourself and others, for it's one of the toughest parts of the wellness program. Because especially when we're stuck in anger or negativity, or we've just, or a relationship is falling apart, or our GPA is suffering, or whatever it is, it's so easy to then say that's how it is. When all of us are more than that. A client that I had, when they were continually negative, you know, they were always like, you know, and I told them how I told that everything is basically whatever they did is okay, you know, and it's like, oh, everything's okay with you, and it's like, well, do you want it to not be okay, you know? And it's like the dishwasher. If you had the dishwasher who broke one dish but is aloof to it, versus one who breaks ten but is working on it. To that one, you'd say it's okay, right? So in a relationship, the difference between things being okay or not, or in a workplace being okay or not, is as long as it's recognized, that's, that's not how things should be, right? Like, I think people of different races and religions are extremely tolerant of racism and bigotry that exists today. But when we say, deal with it, then less so, because then there's also less hope of peace in the future. You know, and I, I wouldn't say that if someone's racist or bigoted, that they're a bad person. I'd say that's just their truth. And unfortunately, I'm sure there's people out there may hate a race or religion just because of stories that have been told. For stories can be some of the most powerful things in our universe. They can start wars or heal wounds, depending on how they're used. The difference between things being okay or not is that we know that our hatred for ourselves and others is not who we are does not define us, does not define our group. And we can all learn to be, and yes, if some, if there's a race that's committing a lot of crimes and there's statistical proof that a particular race just happens to be warmongers or something, yes, we should do something about it. But we should never let ourselves get whipped up by fake math over, you know, races. You know, we have to let the truth speak for itself and not our emotions, for emotions will make truth out of lies and lies out of truth and make communications impossible. You know, or like in a relationship, the difference between a relationship flaw becoming a negative factor or an endearing one that's at least tolerable is ownership of them in progress instead of defending them more than the relationship itself. Itself For anger will lead to more stress and then more negative habits, etc. It doesn't matter how woke we think we are or how enlightened we think we are, or how much better we think we are than the other side of the aisle or whatever. That's irrelevant. That's fight or flight thinking. The only thing that matters is how can I better understand the other side of the aisle? It doesn't matter how cultist or crazy we think the other side of the aisle may be or close-minded. For in our human 
experience. The only thing that ever matters is how can we work better together? How can we work more and more side by side to make this life one worth living for all? Where all of us can get help overcoming our depressions and so on. Yet at the same time, in our urging to walk towards a goal, whether it's weight loss or relationship or whatever, we can often lose faith and give up. It's like people climbing Mount Everest are told, do not focus on the top or you won't make it. Focus on your steps and you're guaranteed to get three steps ahead and then one day you'll realize you made it. For if we let ourselves be afraid of what we don't have or what we could lose, it'll tend to keep happening. Like a client who wanted to lose weight in order to then leave their loved ones so they could then feel bad for not being connected. But it was fight or flight that made them not connected. Not that them, so like relationships there feel like the other is like falling away from them, falling out of love, becoming more like a business arrangement. It's fight or flight, not that something's wrong with them. Like it's, it's so prolific how much fight or flight is poisoning all of our lives, all of our industries, all of our potential, all of our success, all of our love, all of our health. I mean, it's funny how often we can be afraid of doing the wrong move or the wrong thing that we end up becoming paralyzed. Like I told this to a martial arts class I was teaching. You know, I told them all without in mind, pick a movement. And they all did. I said, now I'm going to try to punch each of you in the face as fast as I can. And you have to do that move. And they're like, oh, cr you know, crap. What did we get into? This sucks. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, every one of them dodged, you know. And just like in martial arts and just like in life, the reason most of us get hurt is not from the things that we do, but from the things that we don't, from the opportunities that we watch drift by. And should, and f should we fail, so be it. At least we learn how to do things better. Unfortunately, in today's age, we do also have to be tact and careful about our actions. But more people generally will get injuries in bed than playing football. Yes, the injuries from football can be larger, but you get the point that is from our inaction that most of our pain comes, most of our lost opportunities, most of our disease. A uh, body that's out of motion will atrophy. And if I had to choose between playing a professional football game while being untrained or watching my entire body go into atrophy over time, I'll choose the first. Like we have to be willing to allow ourselves to fail, to allow others to fail. We have to be willing to try, even if we've experienced pain of the past. You know, I like to think in self-improvement that one of the most terrifying powers is that if we became able to manifest all of our thoughts, and then in our worry of others, we worry about their death and they die. We worry about more die and they die. We worry about things happening and they manifest. To me, that would be the most terrifying power of all. But it's partly true. Not with wizard-like powers or abilities, but with gentle magnetism, making things more or less true based on fears or beliefs alone. You know, again, it's like this universe is designed to give us everything we've ever wanted. But since it's a machine, it can't tell the difference between our fears and our dreams. It's like the old quote, if a man thinks he can or can't, he's right. And again, our self-belief is not based on our apparent success, but by the isolated power of positivity itself. And the darker we get, the harder it becomes to work on. But the more insistent we become on working on it, the more successful we become at it. Things that we fear or worry about or get mad about our own minds will not manifest them magically. There is magnetism to our thoughts in the universe, and we will tend to, at the very least, make micro changes within ourselves, in our face, in our emotions, in our actions, to bring them more about. We're afraid of a loved one falling out of love with us, so then we hound them more, and we make them feel more trapped, less independent. We push all of our pains and fears more and more onto them and don't try to independently heal ourselves from within and thereby pushing them away. Our thoughts and beliefs act as small magnets in our lives in the universe, which is why it's so critical to try to change our language from negative affirmations to positive. Instead of saying, I hate my life, screw everything, maybe it's my life only kind of sucks, and maybe things can get better. Maybe that's too much of a stretch. Whatever the next better statement is, stick to it, own it, and feel proud that you got there. We have to be able to take pride in our small steps. Otherwise, looking at how far 
the eventual goal is just going to keep us feeling ashamed with that we're not there, that we don't have that relationship or that job or that, you know, whatever that thing is that we wish we had. And the things that we do have that other people wish that they had, we then will devalue. You know, like the person who has, who doesn't have the job but has a relationship will have a hard time valuing that relationship, whereas the person who has a job but not the relationship will have a hard time valuing the strength of their job. Everything affects everything. There's nothing that doesn't affect anything, at least in an indirect way. It's like the old quote, if a man thinks he can or can't, he's right. You know, so then a big part of the puzzle of getting better is being willing and fighting to try to change the positivity in our minds. And again, it, positivity appears to have nothing to do with the universe around us. You know, a lot of us have felt real pain, real setbacks, real sadness, real judgment, and told ourselves, that's it. Life sucks. The goal is, is impossible. All of those things. And you get the feeling that rest and digest based self-improvement is kind of more about trying to let go of the fight or flight fears and pains. I feel it's impossible to be fully in rest and digest all the time. Our brains are just too wired. We're just too overstimulated. We're too constantly on the go. And being on the go is not rest and digest, but you can learn to become in rest and digest mode on the go. Just like professional fighters, can be in combat with their lives on the line and learning to stay calm and centered. It just takes training of the body and the mind, which is why I feel that everyone to a degree should do some form of martial arts or playful sparring with their partner um, at the you know very least motion. You know, like um, all the wellness activities will affect your relationship, your mindset, your mentality, your everything. Uh, including exercise. So like if you want your relationship to get better or if you want to get into a relationship, if you want to have more strength at work, if you want to have more health, if you want to be able to lose more weight, do some squats. You know, um, squats, planks, sit-ups are key exercises, not just for health and fitness, but also for love itself. And if you're not doing them, you can't say you really want either. If you really want them, if you truly, truly want to be able to do them better, or if you want to be prepared for when you do find someone, do them. Because it's, it's important for us to realize that the wellness activities are not singular in benefits. It's important to recognize for each of the wellness activities, and there are many others out there, I've just known those have just, for me and people I've seen, been very powerful ones. But it's important for each of the wellness activities to draw your own lines to the multiple areas of your life that they can help you with that they help us all with, right? So like, I enjoy trying to look at new exercise routines or new workouts and give them a try. Like motion is not like four hours in the gym or nothing. Actually, the, one of the quickest ways to recover a muscle or build a muscle is doing a little bit once an hour on the hour. That is the fastest possible. And then if you also use peppermint oil diluted on the area, like the products that we have on our website, amazing companies, amazing. Every recovery is person, person's best friend. But it's tough in our paths of getting better that we will have to work on the math of negativity itself, where positivity becomes fractionated and negativity becomes multiplied. You know, hence you can call fight or flight Eeyore mode. Or someone who's been in pain, they can appear to have like a woe was me attitude or been in pain. Except more often the people who spread rumors about people having a woe was me attitude to begin with, themselves were largely responsible for putting them there. It's just how it works. Like in our world, the, unfortunately, there's people who just don't care about others, who don't care about their wives, their legacy, you know, would th throw their legacy under the bus just to protect their image, you know, and speak badly about everyone around them and many other people in the field. And through their own misdeeds and unkindness and acts out of fight or flight. And they, they may be, it may not even be intentional. It's just they're stuck in their own depression and anger that they hurt others that they misinform others, that they give false hope, false promises, or just direct attacks, or whatever it may be, you know? And then in the resulting painful self-preservation of fight or flight dictates that, especially men more than women, if one, if they make one more mistake, do one more thing wrong, get one more complaint, that they feel they could literally die physically. So then to survive, anyone who then disagrees with them must be character assassinated or attacked, mentally, physically, so on. It must be proven for the sake of their own image that those who would doubt them or those who would stand up to them are not team players, are negative people, are not respectful to people around them and so on. Projection.
There's so much in our world where people who are claiming that other people have the problem themselves began it, or themselves sowed the seeds of discourse. Which is why, for us to have a chance of really improving our world, we have to stop pointing the finger at others, or ourselves, and simply, like the samurai, be willing to just walk the path of understanding of peace, and not be willing to cause harm to another if we feel it will help ourselves or protect our overly precious image. For that, more surely than direct attack, will make us hyper-depressed. We have to learn to fractionate negativity. Maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe they were just in pain. And we have to learn to multiply positivity where the flower does matter. Like the client whose husband told her she was fat and then later said, I'm sorry, I was in a mood. You know, I didn't mean that. We need to be able to say when someone says something negative or mean or hurts us to be able to say, you know, maybe they didn't mean it personally. Because most people don't. No one, when they later feel better or Zen later says, no, actually, you know, I do hate your face. You know, no one really says that. There are a few who do and let them enjoy their lives and don't be so worried about them. Like it's funny how with us as human beings, someone can say a single sentence that takes seconds to say, but we can talk about the anger that we felt from that sentence for days and years because of the multiplicative factor of negativity of fight or flight or stress mode. The better we learn to walk this journey and fight the path towards positivity itself. Like in our Western world, we heavily undervalue positivity, like a fairy tale science. But to the degree of stress that we have in our world, in the world around us, to the degree of challenges we face, is to the degree we must master our own wellness activities, or we will simply slowly die and fall apart and die a slow, painful death. That's just how it works, unfortunately. But fortunately, there is a path, there is a way, and all it takes is the, de the decision to slowly walk the path out of the chasm, out of the black hole magnet magnetic properties of negativity itself, and to be accepting of oneself where they are on their own scale of positivity. Then day by day, ask themselves, what more can I do to help others, to be there for others, to help myself heal? How can I get more and more into this positive mindset? Whether it's eight hour affirmations overnight as we sleep, whatever they may be, but we have to find them and we have to work on them. And which is why in our society, we need to focus more on good news. We need good news news stations. We need radio stations to dedicate a time of the day to focus on good news. And then as an audience, we need to have patience for that news because in our over stimulated society, we tend to only care about the most clickbait topics and nothing else. We need to learn to grow our patience ourselves so that someone can have a cute story and we can admire it. It's why I also love the Journey radio station where it's just tons of positive songs. We have to try to fill our world more with positivity and we can't just keep focusing on the negative. For there is so much beauty in our world. There are so many amazing people, amazing healers, amazing everything. But we focus only on the pain and we start to believe that life is less and less worth living when it is the most beautiful thing ever created. But it is up to us to gain the strength to face our own inner demons. And again, not with self-judgment, but with self-acceptance and movement. There is no reason that we can't work together to make this world a heaven on earth. I had this client, amazing woman, very powerful, very successful with many kids. And I asked her when she could come in again, because she definitely needed additional work. And she's like, so it was great. Thank you so much. But I, I just don't have time to take care of myself. Well, you're starting to snap at your kids, aren't you? And she's like, how, how could you know that? Well, you're starting to snap about things and more viciously than you have in the past. She's like, yeah, but how, how would you know that? I'm like, that's not you. This is just how fight or flight works. And I'll talk about fight or flight with different people and they'll be like, how do you know about that about me? How do you, what's wrong with me? It's like, nothing's wrong with you. This is just how fight or flight dictates our behavior. And we have to individually learn how to overcome it in our own way. Like the rest and just base self-improvement needs to be from the point of view of self-acceptance knowing that at least as long as we're on this path, this humble path, it then becomes possible to accept ourselves, accept others, but the path isn't going to be easy or pretty. 
And the more we're able to make those changes to our environment, to our lives, to our workplaces, etc., the more we're able to train ourselves to enjoy this journey of fitness, of health, of motion, of dieting, of everything that the healing world has to offer, the better everything else becomes. It's really incredible to me to try to consider how much for all of us who feel, I, I just don't have the time to take care of myself. Instead, if you consider how much time and money we lose to anger, pain, sorrow, stress, illness, loneliness, injuries, arguments, war, it's insane. When to be well, generally you can do it in about maybe 30 minutes a day, something. It, it, you don't have to be in meditation all day, 24 hours a day. In our modern world, there are modern solutions, but we have to do them. Do something. We have, I mean, that's why, you know, again, precision massage and healing. For $30 a month, you can get a 30 minute massage with precision hot stones and all the works and essential oils something, some additional help to get you to where you want to go, to where you need to go, to where you deserve to go. And we shouldn't keep telling ourselves, I need to watch my weight. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need. It's not because you need to. It's because you want to, because you can. And like, again, we have to work on changing our language. When we can start to work on self-improvement and conflict resolution more from a place of inner peace, it becomes more possible to find common ground. Like, for example, in gun legislation, both sides, to a degree, are right. Like, yes, a psychopath should not be able to go and buy semi-automatic. That's just insane. But with how badly we do legislation in our country, that could become re-understood to no one can have a gun at all forever. And although the oppressions we're facing in our modern economy are far greater than an immediate oppression from the lack of gun control, that if we completely lost all gun rights, then down the line that could lead to another oppressive environment, though I believe pales minusculely to the amount of economic oppression that we're feeling today. So the real answer, I believe, to gun control is creating a new type of legislation that cannot be re-understood. That, and if the Senate wants to make changes, it has to start from ground zero. Start all, like, back from, from, back from the beginning. And that if down the line, if anything wants to be re-understood or changed, it would have to be started from the beginning, and then the last bill wouldn't be canceled until the new bill successfully got into place. So you wouldn't be able to just mess with it by proposing some new change that killed it. We have to be able to work with each other and find these common ground solutions. The truth will tend to be more in the middle. Though it's funny in history, the times when we supported and businesses need to be supported for they they're the job creators. But there needs to be there can't be crony capitalism at the same time. There shouldn't be billions of money being spent on lobbyists and whatnot to get unfair advantages that then hurt the people. It's funny in our history when exorbitant amounts of money went to Wall Street and our big corporations and companies, we had depressions. Yet, in times of our history where more support was done to the people, we had more booms in recovery. And I don't, obviously no one wants Venezuela, but then again in Ve Venezuela, less than 10 to 5% of the money went to the people, or 90% one of it to crony capitalism. And positions in Venezuela were awarded to people who were loyal to the dictator, instead of being competent. And then they easily ran into this situation where they couldn't even afford to refine their own oil. It's not being kind to people is not the evil that can destroy us. It's greed, it's corruption, it's crony capitalism that can push us all into the mud. And I was talking to a client, you know, about all this and about positivity and stuff. And they were like, oh no, you know, I get this positivity stuff. I just, I internalize it. I like to write down my affirmations. I like my positivity. You know, it's, I just keep it within me, which sounds good, but I was like, wait, well, like, you keep it more like a closet inside, but you don't let it show. And they're like, well, yeah, kind of. I'm like, yeah, we, we can't be like, oh yeah, that positive stuff. I'll just, I'll just keep that inside lock and key. Well, I feel pain towards the world and I feel judged and I feel angry and I have a hard time letting things go. We all do. It's, it's tough to face judgment and anger and try to learn to just greet it with love, acceptance, compassion, and communication. That's why affirmations, we need to at least get to the point where we can say positive sentences out loud. And there's great apps out there. There's great videos out there. You can make your own list of things you wish were more true and then say them as if they are. There's so many ways you can do it. And I don't care if it's one sentence a day. Just today is going to be a great day. And before you go to sleep, like I'm going to rest and heal body and mind tonight. I don't care if it's one sentence. 
but we have to be willing to do something if we want to expect things to get better, and we need to. World peace depends on each of us taking self-improvement seriously. We can no longer afford to keep, you know, skirting the responsibility, for world peace lies within all of us. We have to figure out how, step by step, we can each contribute to making our environments cleaner, more organized, more welcoming, more fair, more just. Why don't we make hospitals more relaxing and beautiful? All women going into labor are surrounded by lights and serious faces and bare walls. That's tough. Like, why don't we put at least more wall murals in hospitals of, like, scenic beach scenes or waterfalls or... I definitely understand you can't fill hospitals with plants and stuff because it could get in the way. But we should make... Why can't we make hospitals, our work environments, more things, more of a place of beauty that helps us get into rest and digest from which everything else can become more effective? That's why I like to go through such lengths to try to make our room as beautiful as possible. Because the more beautiful the room, the more the healing actions and the massage itself can take effect. Um, scientifically, the person's nerves can become less stimulated just from becoming relaxed from the environment, which then allows for more heat and pressure than they otherwise could have tolerated. Um, part of the keys to working on people with fibromyalgia is to help them lower their sensitivity and facilitation of their nerves so then progress can be possible. Um, so making things beautiful is not just foo-foo. It's not just, you know, for fun. It has an actual biochemical, physiological effect in our minds and our bodies. So getting some ornaments, some paintings, some few things to just add to try to lift our spirits is not hopeless. It may be one of the only hopes we have of beginning this path towards positivity till we can start doing some motion, some exercises once an hour on the hour. Most of us are able to stand up from our desks or our work and do some twists or some squats. Or at the very least, while we're at work, trying to watch our stress levels so that there's something of us left when we get home to then be able to do some exercises or movements. You know, in our corporate America, we devalue wellness so much that most of us arrive back home a noodle with nothing left of us to then give for our families except for the war stories and complaints that we've gathered throughout the day. And we need to change that. We need to, you're fo if you're focused on the negativity of the work environment, more of that's going to happen. If you're focused on how you always get rejected, it's more of that's going to happen. That's just how the power of belief works gentle magnets in the directions of our thoughts. So in closing, it's as we commit more and more to this thing called self-improvement and not with judgment, with self-acceptance and love. Love is a little tough, but at least acceptance is possible. I guarantee that the more motion you get into, that the more you do these steps, the more everything else will begin to work out. Everyone who's depressed out there that's not in a relationship, if you can first work on yourself, and grow strength stronger yourself, then if the person you meet is more of a healer kind of person, it, you make it easier for them to then help rise you up. Everything helps everything. Like in fact, when people are in a lot of pain and they're like, man, you know, I can't get an appointment for another week or two, I say, hey, actually that's okay. Because health is very much like surfing in a way where if you're in the water and I try to pull you towards the shore, it's going to be hard for you to catch the wave. But if you can start doing some wellness actions, start taking those hot Epsom salt baths, taking, doing some stretches, drinking your water, watching your diet, then you create your own motion before you even arrive to the practice. And then that allows us to give you the benefits of 10 hours of massage in one hour. And this applies to any, it doesn't apply just when you're visiting your massage therapist, but life, the more we do these things, the more it helps everything else. So every one of the wellness activities is helping at least 10 to 20 things at once. And if you take time, you'll be able to list them out. And it may be a good exercise to know that we're not doing squats just for a nice butt. We're doing it for the cardiovascular. We're doing it for the health. We're doing it for the health of the mind. We're doing it to overcome our depression. We're doing it to generate daily energy. We're doing it because it happens to be a very important muscle um, for significant others and our ability to use it as, you know, squats, um, planks, sit-ups. And then when you put your shoulders on a bed and you lift um, your hips up, like exercises, all of the wellness activities, they help so much more than the apparent thing that they do. 
And you'll find that as you commit to him, I promise you, everything else will start to work out. And it may be a bumpy road. It may be two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, four steps back. And that's okay. It's okay if things are not perfect. It's okay if you hate your neighbor. But maybe in the next day, you work on giving him a little less hatred, a little less of a resting bitch face. Whatever the small improvement is to your local environment, to your relationship, to your work, to the world, what matters more than anything is that we are accepting of ourselves and we are willing to make these small changes. And I have full faith that I myself can become a better healer and a better walker of this path of peace, just like every one of you can. For already, so much of what I know is from you, from my patients, my clients, my friends, and I'm continually taught every day how to become a better healer, a better listener. And I for one feel that I will be done with self-improvement once we have world peace. Chapter 9, Helping Others Helping others can be tough because a lot of people can take help as an insult. Or if someone is flipping out or stressed or angry, just being like, hey, you know, let's have some ginkgo bilboa tea with ginseng and garlic to help calm the nerves. Like, you sing them, you see calling me angry, you sing them not calm, I'm not calm, ah! You know, where people who are in pain will oft, can often defend their pain and anger and stress more than the relationship or the help at hand. You know, like fighting the doctor, fighting the nurse, fighting the healer, sort of a thing. Fighting the spouse that's trying to help. The help is tough, you know, especially when we ourselves have pain. And it took a lot of effort just to try to be there for someone else who's then guarding their own pain more than the relationship with you. It's tough, you know? And for a lot of us who feel we have our own pain, it's like we're dying a slow death with a samurai sword through our stomachs, lying on the floor, counting our last breaths as someone next to us dubs their toe. And we're supposed to say, hey, are you okay? But that's the exact skill we each need to learn to work on. For a lot of our pains are in our minds, and the more, if we don't learn to do that, then the more pain that we each get in our lives, the less we become able to care about one another. The more we become laser focused on our own fears and needs, regardless of who else gets hurt. Like we become willing to kick 10,000 people off of food stamps if it, if it gives us a dollar more in our tax return. Like it, it's, and it's nothing wrong with people. It's how our brains are designed to become more and more laser focused on our own fears, our own needs, regardless of the cost to others. And that's something we have to train ourselves to overcome. And when you're dealing with people who are in pain, you can't say, oh, it's not that bad. Or, oh, yeah, you're just exaggerating. Because real pain, especially like, dear God, clinical depression, it's like having Chuck Norris morphed with a rock. It is one of the strongest, scariest, toughest foes to face. And apparent motionlessness or depression doesn't mean that that person is worthless or something. It just means that the negative impact life has thrown at them is temporarily greater than they are. And they need help with friendship, with compassion, helping them understand these different parts of the mind, helping them walk the path to wellness, helping them get into more motion. And the better we can help others, the better we learn to help our own internal batters, battles. And not just by, don't just volunteer clock in, clock out, but to really be there for others, to really try to understand these internal conflicts of the mind that affects us all. The better we learn to successfully help others rise out of their chasms, the better we can overcome our own. It's important to honor, to value the amount of pain that someone's going through. I believe people going through clinical depression should get a Nobel Peace Prize because of the sheer amount of burden on their shoulders. And I mean, not really, that would be made fun of, but that's the level of respect and honor they deserve in their paths of recovery. And when they do something small, it has to be valued. If they finally get back to writing, they need to be supported. You know, if they finally get to the gym, they should be cheered. If they finally make a change to their, their diet. And we should do that with within relationships, within um, groups, you know. Like someone mentions that they've started intermittent fasting or whatever their wellness step is or whatever they did that they enjoyed. You know, applaud them, support them, encourage them. You know, for the better, we have to stop just living in our own bubbles, our own minds. And start 
and to be willing to help others, to be willing to listen to others, to be willing to encourage others. And the better we each do that, the more encouragement and support and help we then will get back. If we can make our society one in which we are quick to listen and slow to act, one in which we are more interested in how can we help make things more positive instead of how can we better destroy those that we fear? How can we better hurt those that we hate? Only then can this world become one worth living in. When we're trying to help others, I like to think of a story of the wind and the sun that many, many of you may have heard where there's a man wearing a jacket, but let's say in this version that is killing him, set in his ways. So sure that he's, you know, inspired, woke, or whatever you want to say, he's just, this jacket's killing him. And this isn't about who's right or wrong, but the wind, you know, really worried about this guy. He's like, you know, I'm going to help get this guy's jacket off. I've got to save him. And he blows and he blows and he blows as hard as he can. But the harder the wind blows, the harder the man holds the jacket to him. When the sun says, oh, I got this. And the sun just gives the man unconditional love, acceptance, knows that he is not these things, he is not his anger, his hatredness, his laziness, any bigotry or racism, none of us are those things, and he just accepts that man for who he is inside, you know, gives him love, warmth, and soon the man says, huh, that's too warm for a jacket. If you see a deer in the forest, if you try to approach the deer or use force to get to it, it will run, just like many of us will. But if you first work on yourself, if you first make yourself peaceful inside, instead of how so many of us can be quick to point the finger while we ourselves are angry and in fight or flight mode, for fight or flight self-improvement just generally tends not to make things better and make yourself in that environment more peaceful, make the space safe. And the deer will come, and as it comes, to not judge it. it be like, I told you so, finally you came. But to give it that warmth and acceptance. And so too, that's how we need to learn to deal with each other, to be okay with each other's pain, and okay with each other's setbacks, and okay with each other's imperfections and okay with each other's different opinions, for God's sakes. God forbid we believe different things. But obviously when it comes down to harm coming to people, then we should be more serious, but from a place of peace than how to improve things based on math, science. I don't think history is a good tool to use for trying to figure things out because invariably in our cognitive biases and bubbles and stressed out fight or flight modes we'll tend just to point to the aspects of history that proves our point without really trying to think how can we fix this if your boat was sinking in the water you wouldn't care what happened in history is like how can we work to make something happen now what mathematically economically makes sense um, but i don't want to go too far on that because i want to keep this book efficient, if you will, and just purely to these points. And I don't think I'm the best person on the planet of figuring out how to apply rest and digest base mode to helping others and, you know, geopolitics and all this stuff. I'm, I know every, most people out there, especially anyone who's into politics as a profession, can so often feel like we're discovering new truths and diving deeper and deeper into a rabbit hole. And we treat multiple people saying the same thing as more and more evidence. Whether or not they're talking about the same person they heard it from, or whether they're saying they saw it themselves, and if they did, do we verify that we so often will treat repetition as evidence? I don't know who said, if you say something enough, it becomes true, but that's generally how we tend to operate, even within ourselves. If someone tells us that something's wrong with us over and over, we'll start to behave that way, let alone believe that in other individuals. We have to stop treating repetition as evidence within others and without. Like IQ is not a factor in cognitive bias or only believing things that already agree with what you tend to believe is true, which many of us do. We choose our very selected um, inputs for news, and if they say something is so, we believe it. If a friend says there was an accident around the corner, we believe it. Instead of just believing that they believe that there's an accident around the corner. We too often get so pent up and cut up into our own beliefs, worries, and fears 
Like one thing that's really hard for a lot of people out there is being afraid of for others' sake. You know, like being afraid of things that are apparently out of our control. Maybe we're just worried of our small spot on the shore when the center of the lake is getting an oil spill. Or just someone's kids, just they're out in the world now and just worried sick about them. But much like the samurai, we have to be willing to take swift and peaceful action on the things that we can do. And the less be as they are. And instead of spending so much time in fear about what could happen out in the world, spending time in peaceful prayer. And prayers can become dangerous. If someone's out there, you know, in the military, don't pray for them to come home. Pray for them to come home well and in one piece. I do believe there's power to prayer, but in that power, I believe is responsibility. We shouldn't be praying for the other side of the aisle to be defeated. We should just be praying for wellness, prosperity, equal playing fields for all. We should be praying for the rich to be able to enjoy being rich, and we should be able to pray that the poor are able to find more worthwhile work that can pay a living wage, and so on. But I don't want to get too much into those weeds, because then you can get into disagreements. But as far as worrying about others, I like to consider what if you were on another world where your kids would have to go and fight with weapons, you know, once they turn 13 to prove their adulthood. But you are so worried about them and their battles, so stressed out about how much pain they may come into that when they finally did come back home for emergency services, there was nothing left of you to be there for them. Worrying for others does them no good. It doesn't help them, it poisons yourself, and unfortunately because of the slight magnetic properties of thought and prayer. If any of you did worry about something and something negative happened, it's not you didn't do it. Fight or flight itself tries to dictate where we were wrong, what our mistakes were. We're in rest and digest what's more important is going forward. How do we become more positive? How do we prevent more suicides? How do we, you know, become more healthier, sexier, able, more able, more successful? Rest and digest is all about how do we heal? How do we improve? How do we grow? And not getting stuck on what's past. I would say it's one of the most important things because we get where attention goes, you know, as we mentioned, easy, like um, where the mind goes, attention flows and results show. It's true. It's like um, in the secret. Again, this is not something to use to blame yourself or ourselves for things that have already passed. This is only something to be used to the benefit of the future. We have to be willing to let others fail and succeed on their own as we do our best to help them from afar. And not as the wind with I told you so's and you better listen to me, but as the sun and with acceptance. Because you know, who, who knows? Maybe there's cases where we're trying to give someone else advice that we ourselves should be listening to. You know, and I believe wholeheartedly that if we're able to put our heads together, have conversations, that we can easily make life more fair, just, prosperous, and generally more worth living for all. Helping others is not just a good thing to do. It's often a very powerful wellness activity to itself. And if you're volunteering, don't just clock in, connect. And if you're, if you're out, or out in the world and a volunteer is helping you, don't treat them, I would say don't treat them like a waiter, but no one should treat waiters with disrespect either. There is no situation that calls for disrespect to one another. People going to a hospital, you're worried your loved one is sick and dying and you're screaming at the doctor, please give me these results, you know, or whatever it is. The more you yell at that doctor, the nurse, the techs, the staff, the more you are pushing them into fight or flight mode, the less they become able to work on your loved one. If you are really worried about your pet or your loved one or whoever you're worried about, the best thing you can do for them is to be nice to the staff. And if you see someone else being mean to the staff, speak up because that stuff affects doctors, staff, and so on. If they're being screamed at, they can't, you know, their, their vision is going to become more singular, linear, and narrow, and more likely to miss these fringe possibilities that could make the difference between life and death. And again, if you just yelled at a doctor because you were worried about your loved one and they unfortunately passed away, don't blame yourself. Because ultimately, I do believe that things that pass in this universe have a reason. Unfortunately, sometimes that reason is stupidity or mistakes. But even within those, there are reasons. 
We have to be willing to trust ourselves. We have to be willing to accept ourselves and stop spending so much time blaming ourselves or attacking ourselves for that's irrelevant. You can't go to any bank and say, hey, I have a lot of problems and I really beat myself up a lot and with Bruce Lee masterfulness. Can I cash that in? They'll be like, no, what are you talking about? Problems are irrelevant. Only the solutions matter. And the only thing that truly matters is how we can best heal ourselves so that we can then be of better use and more effective and more able to help uplift others. Honestly, that's the entire name of the game. And I know each and every one of out, you out there, in some way, shape, or form, are going to play a positive part in our unified world path to wellness. Chapter 10. Fight for the Inch. Most of us know what we should be doing, but whether or not we have the energy to do them can be an entirely other matter. When I was in the cult, or let's say the religion that's lost its own way, I was in charge of keeping 50,000 square feet of space cleaned and maintained, an impossible goal by any standard. But yet, if anything wasn't perfect, I would get screamed at, not yelled at, screamed at, with enough, enough ferocity that you almost wanted to call them an ambulance. You know, like, dude, you okay? You know, if this can't be good for your heart, calm down. Stop attacking me with such force, you can just kill yourself. That's what anger is. We poison ourselves, wishing unwell on another. That was my daily life, getting screamed at for not being able to do the impossible. I'd wake up at 5 every morning and go to sleep at 1 a.m. I had no time. No time. Yet there would be staff that would have to help me for a little bit out of the day. Some of them couldn't figure out how to turn on a vacuum with one button, which is okay. Sounds funny, but usually it's because someone had dislodged the filter and then the thing wouldn't turn on. To me, it was hard not to get upset when they would make honest mistakes or just not know how things worked. And at first I was like, oh hell no, I do not have time for you guys. You all need to just figure out your own stuff. I do not have that extra inch of energy for you. you, just leave me alone. But time went on and things did not get better. And I was watching my energy slowly die. And I knew the only chance I had of surviving that place alive. I was the only one in the history of that religion that survived that post for longer than a year. And one of the previous reasons was suicide. Like this, this post was no joke. It was the perfect combination of ferocious, ferocious beyond imagination management above and the most incompetent juniors below. You, you were basically just like a punching bag, basically. I knew the only chance I had of surviving that post with my life, and I was the only one in the history of that religion that survived that post for more than a year. And one of the reasons for a previous person leaving post was suicide. So I, I was in deep water. I was up to my, I did not have that extra inch at all, but I knew it was my only chance. So I, I fought. I dig deep down and I fought to find those extra moments I could spare to turn, show the person how to turn on the vacuum, to show someone else the better cleaner to use for what they were doing, to show someone else a technique where they could finish, you know, their duties and get home faster. And during those times, the screaming only multiplied. They didn't care that the reason I was not doing as many cleaning actions myself was because I was helping others learn how to. They didn't care. They only cared about the day. Fight or flight doesn't care about the future. Screw the future. Now is only what matters. Who cares about long-term company profits? Now is the only thing that matters. Who cares about long-term company longevity in a changing world? Today is the only thing that matters. And I'm pretty sure boards out there, if, if a CEO does something that sacrifices short-term profits for long-term gains, I'm pretty sure many boards will fire them these days. We are so narrow-minded as a country, as a world, but it's fight or flight. It's not the people to blame. There's, no, there's nothing to fear but fear itself, nothing to hate but hate itself. Because it will give us more and more things to hate and more and more things to fear and the fear itself will only paralyze us in the face of our obstacles and dreams. But after months and months of dealing with a deeper hell than I thought I had the bones to stand, finally things became easier. Finally I was able to get ahead of my cleaning actions. Finally I was ahead, I was able to get ahead of my cleaning actions. Finally I was able to have more, it was still a ridiculous job. And luckily management really noticed the effects that I had done. 
and properly rewarded me with a demotion. But hey, that's what you get for being in a cult. It doesn't, we can't live our lives based on the acceptance of others or what we think that certification or the a passing grade. We can't let external factors dictate what we think of ourselves and whether or not we even try. Too often we feel we don't have that extra inch within us, but I promise you, if I could find it in that hell hellhole, you can too in your own life. And that extra inch is where the magic is of life. It's it's that extra, no matter what it, like most of us know what we should do. We know who we should talk to. We know the health things we should do. We know this, we know what we should be doing. It's just a matter of summoning that extra inches worth of dedication, of motivation. And if day by day, we can just move an inch towards our dreams, eventually we will make it. You know, failure only exists in the moment that we give up. Only in that moment, only in the moment where we say, you know what, this is too much for me, I can't go on, it's over, there's no recovery, you know, no one loves me, everyone hates me, and all of these fight or flight lies. But if we can just decide that no matter how slowly our climb to wellness is going to be, no matter how slow our climb to success is, that we stay dedicated to motion, even if that motion is lifting your finger while being paralyzed in bed all day. Any motion, but being dedicated just to motion for motion's sake, then success all of a sudden in that moment of decision becomes guaranteed and no longer a matter of if, but when. Motion is everything. And it's, again, it's okay if you're paralyzed. It's okay if you're motionlessness. You know, like the stories of it's okay. And the difference between something being okay or not is as long as we recognize that's not us and we want to work on it. Even if it takes you three weeks to do one squat or drink a little more water or a little less ice cream or soda or caffeine that hit like a truck and will just des and destroy all of our lives slowly over time. Whatever your speed is, that's okay, and we need to learn to be more encouraging to one another in our workplaces and in our lives and relationships. We should be more free with the words, thank you, good job, I appreciate you, you make life easier for me. No matter how small the thing is, or if someone makes a mistake, God forbid, instead of shooting their head off or explaining to them the intricacies of the idiocy of their move, instead, why can't we just tell each other, it's okay, you know, we're working on it. It's okay, we're growing, or even better. You feel angry today? That's odd. You know, why? We There's no reason that we can't learn to be more positive to others. And if we can force ourselves to be more positive for others, to help encourage others, keep going, good job, don't worry about that. Just, you know, review these things and, you know, come back swinging. The better we can learn to do that for others, the better we can learn to do it for ourselves. It's no easier to tell ourselves good job. It's no easier to tell ourselves just keep swinging. It's harder, much harder. So often we feel that positivity or affirmations is a lie when in my opinion they are the very beginning of a wellness journey no matter what that inch is we have to stay committed to it and again no matter the speed and if that inch is just you know saying we can do it if that inch is just being more positive to ourselves, whatever that inch is from aromatherapy to wellness to diet to um going to orange theory or other gyms you know whatever we feel our next step is break that down into steps break that step down into steps always keep your eye only on your next footstep for people climbing mount everest are all told you know like we've talked about to only look at your feet or you'll give up we have to make the journey itself the steps that things were dedicated to the steps not the test not residency not the relationship not the thing that we wish we had most but learning to enjoy the steps towards that thing if you're not in a relationship but you're learning to enjoy movement if you're learning to enjoy becoming more positive if you're learning to enjoy being healthier and growing you're gonna be that much more stronger and in any relationship become strongest when it's each one is working on their own depressions or anxiety, motivations, and self-growth from a place of peace, then one plus one equals 11. But if each one is dying to their own stresses and fears and worries and phobias, then one plus one equals negative a million. And war is definitely, this is definitely a shorter chapter, but to me is the most important one because a lot of us already know what we should be doing as long as it's done from a place of peace and understanding and not rabbit holism where repetition of data becomes evidence and truth that makes us then want to act or retaliate against things that 
may not even be true. Conspiracy theories are important and healthy, but when it goes too far, I love the movie Oblivion. I think everyone should watch it because it's a beautiful example of when we think we're the heroes, we're on the right side, dot, dot, dot. And I don't want to spoil anything, but it's a beautiful, beautiful movie from that point of view. We have to be able to start our days at least saying today's going to be a good day. Or by the theology of Tai Chi, whatever is a slight adjustment to the moves already being made. Or the statements are. So if you normally say today's going to suck, maybe um, your inch is today's going to half suck. You know, like I, it doesn't matter what your improvement is. Own it. Be proud of it. Do it. Statements like that's odd. Or knowing that no matter how tough life gets, no matter how many curveballs life throws at you, to always stay in motion. Always keep your eyes focused on that next inch and you will make it. For no force in the universe can keep a person down who is dedicated to that inch, even if that inch takes a month. For again, it becomes just a matter of time before that person achieves success in every area of their lives. Or if your next inch is getting the workout clothes or the weights, the gym pass, or the things that you can afford to help out to get that next inch towards movement itself or vitamins, etc., then do it. Obviously within budget, obviously within reason, because um, unfortunately for us human beings, sometimes it's hard to just hit the gym or to just, sometimes we have to break those goals up or sometimes the inch may not even be getting to the gym. That itself is actually quite a big goal to get to. And if you can get there and make that a habit and a routine, good job. But if you can't, don't be hard on yourself. Like again, the path is not about beating ourselves up. It's about picking ourselves up. So maybe the inch is getting a workout outfit. Maybe it's getting a headband. Maybe it's getting better earphones. Maybe it's getting a better water container. Those inches that if we do them, one by one, that eventually we become the superheroes that we were always inside. Chapter 11, Affirmations. In this chapter, I want to talk about affirmations because I truly believe that they are the beginning, the first steps towards improvement of any kind. It's far easier to say, I'm going to lift up that weight than to actually do it. It's far easier to say world peace is possible than to actually go through all of the megalithic actions and dear God paperwork to go about it. Especially as so many other special interests will try to mess with it if the way world peace is shaping out to be isn't best for them. To the powerful, as long as world peace shifts in a way that leads them with the most money in their pockets, then they're okay with it. But if that's not how things are looking, they will destroy it. And they will make world peace itself sound like the enemy. And don't get me wrong, world peace has to be done carefully, because yes, it is possible to have an oppressive unified world government. So we have to be smart and vigilant at the same time, but not so destructive that we attack anyone and everyone who says that world peace is worth thinking of. It's, to me, that's crazy when peace itself appears to be the enemy. And when peace appears to be the enemy, you're, you're cheering for the wrong side. You know, follow whoever you want to follow, but once you believe peace itself is an enemy, something's wrong. And I get that because when people are upset, actually upset at the word of peace, they're not thinking of peace. They're th thinking of unfair socialism. They're thinking of skyrocketed taxes, you know, but that is not just like we are not our anger. We are not our mud. Peace is not socialism, is not lack of laws, is not lack of freedom. Peace is peace. It's love. And all the attachments can go set aside. We have to at least be willing to say we're peaceful. We have to be willing to say we're good people. It feels like in life that we're on this boat and the wa there's a huge waterfall, endless waterfall to our left, and the current is trying to shove us over this thing, and it takes all of our strength not to just become motionless, paralyzed, and just fall over into our black hole chasm of depression and abyss, from which recovery becomes exorbitantly tougher. Like, you think it's hard to get into motion right now? Stay in bed for a few days, the inertia holding you back from getting back to what 
is your normal routine becomes incredible, which is why it's impressive when people to me when people are dealing with clinical depression. That is a beast to deal with, and as impressive as anything, more than the Olympics, it's more impressive to me when someone overcomes clinical depression or chronic pain than the first place gold medal winner in the Olympics. To me, it takes more effort from what I've seen and experienced. One person told me, I don't like affirmations because they feel like a lie. But if we were on that boat heading for the cliff, the lie would be that we're not gonna die today. It's okay, we're gonna do our best. Let's go down swinging. The truth is that we're gonna die, but the hope of an affirmation is that the lies become the truth and the truths become the lies. That we learn work on shaping our positivity and then the universe itself, beginning with our own words. It doesn't have to be drastic. We don't have to say this is the best earth ever, but we should say there is some positivity to it. Dear God, we really need a good news news station and for every radio station to dedicate a part of the day to good news, especially at, at when people are getting off of work and probably before going to bed. All I hope that in the future, all of the shows from 9 to 11 p.m., I'm hoping all of those shows have to be more focused on good news and the shows between work and then can have all the crap. We shouldn't be going to bed listening to crap. We're going to be stressed. We're like, oh crap, that's happening out there. And our body's going to be in fight or flight. We can't sleep as well. And then we're, it's, it just all goes back to fight or flight and accelerating and accelerating aging. In affirmations, like it's important to know that it's actually not a lie. Like if you said you were going to go pick up, let's say a pillow, and you were dedicated to going and picking up that pillow, it's not a lie to say, I picked up the pillow. You're talking from the future from a sense of the future, from a spiritual place of the future, right? It's important to be able to envision ourselves in the future as we walk up this path of wellness towards positive magnetism and away from negative magnetism. It's important. We have to be able to see, not the final goal. So like if we're trying to become skinny, not being like, okay, that's a skinny me. No, that'll just make you feel bad. But to see just your face being happy, that you're happy with this journey itself. You're happy with this new routine that hasn't started yet, but you're doing. And then your affirmation is, I'm on a fitness routine. It's important. We should each, in our journey of trying to stay in motion, where success becomes guaranteed in only a matter of time, and thus we can, you know, honestly speak from future our future selves, we can, affirmations can be anything. We can write a list of our fears, our triggers, etc., and then write the opposite of that as a list. Record that and make that our alarm. You know, like if, let's just say uh, a list is, I hate my life, I hate my career, I'm fat, I'm unlovable, right? Then we record and, you know, into our phones or whatever. I love my life, I love myself, I love my career, I am worth everything and I'm very lovable. Make that your alarm. If, if it's, it's going to be hard to do affirmations in the beginning, but like, just like working out a muscle, it becomes easier and easier as time goes on. And now, as a separate chapter, I'm going to have the affirmations that we do at Precision Massage and Healing for every client, basically. When clients come in, we ask, what are three things you wish were more true? And we kind of tailor these for them. But these are generally the ones we do for everyone. Uh, and we'll put this in the next chapter so you can listen to just that when you want to. Chapter 12, Affirmations. I am healthy, I am well, I am healing, I am healed, I am the calm in the middle of the storm of life itself, and my stillness and the power of my love and my light helps to bring peace and prosperity to everyone and everything around me. My entire family tree is blessed with peace, prosperity, protection, and never-ending laughter and happiness. I naturally flow over all problems to solutions like a peaceful river over rocks, without hesitation, drama, anger, or wasted time or energy. For I know in this world, problems are irrelevant and cannot be cashed at any bank and thus only peaceful solutions take up my mind. I never regret the past or get stuck on what's past or what I feel insecure or lacking on. Instead, I only ever let myself feel that much more motivated to 
to overcome them and to work on the future. I am Zen, and thus I cannot be hurt. And no matter the hurricanes I may face in life, I will forever be a dauntless, peaceful warrior who's committed to my own welfare and self-care, and then the welfare and care of others. And ultimately, I'm awesome because I'm simply me.